Hello and welcome to, uh, so I nearly just called it Rewind Reviews, Harry Potter and the Rewind Reviews, where every week at the moment we are sitting down to watch um, a Harry Potter thing and then reviewing it. It's been a bumpy fucking ride last week, real, real low, um, it, 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 the, the writing, it seemed to us, of Steve Cloves, put under, his, his whole approach put under strain when adapting a longer piece. And we weren't sure if that was just that the book was kind of untranslatable or if it was something to do with his inability to sort of... Uh, his, his, his lack of heart to just cut things, which as fans of the book sounds insane that we're the ones saying that. But, you know, Chris and I... Uh, Chris is my co-host. I'll say hello, Chris, to the people who might be just jumping in at Order of the Phoenix. Don't know why they would, but they might. You never know. Uh, hello, Chris, for the people who might be jumping in at <laughs> Order of the Phoenix. Don't know why they would, but they might be. So that's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, we both kind of felt. Um, <laughs> what? What? I'm just, what an appalling I, dad joke. Carry on. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just moving on. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. Um, you know, we, we both felt that there was this would be a good test for if that's true because Order of the Phoenix is the longest book in the franchise, and we were wondering, you know, if if another writer takes that over and can make a slightly more coherent, less bumpy, less fragments of narrative all over the place sort of movie because they're trying to do everything and make something a bit more cohesive then that would kind of verify our theory that Cloves is, is, is struggles to adapt these longer pieces so with that said um, I, normally we'd say there's history in the first episode if you want to know our history of one of the, you know of the, of the Harry Potter not our history but like our personal back you know sort of a, I don't know what I'm looking for is um yeah, I guess our history with the the franchise. Yeah, our, our experience with them. Yeah, if you want to know whether you know where we come from as fans of the of the franchise back then, how we felt about it then, how we feel about it now, just Harry Potter in general. That's only the first episode, but I will say I've got a little bit of back with this one because this is one of my favorite Harry Potter books. This specific one is sometimes tied with, but often first as my favorite Harry Potter book. I love Order of the Phoenix. It's incredible. It's an absolutely amazing book that does so much so well. So, like Chris going into Azkaban, which is my other one that it sometimes sort of ties with as well. Slight trepidation um, for me, but otherwise, um, you know, our history with the franchise and stuff is he's covered in the first one. That's the only addition I need to add here. Uh, so, yeah, Chris, what, what, how, how did you feel watching Order of the Phoenix? We'll start with you. <laughs> Let's, let's, I've uh, for, for, let's just just a you know not a long answer just but just a few minutes because I think people will be people will be wondering it um, because some people this is a book often cited that people criticise for length uh, Harry's like anger all of that sort of stuff so why why for you and I don't feel that way I love this book but why for for those that may be in that position. Uh, why do you why do you like this this book specifically so much? Because um, also I think that's how well the film adapts those things is relevant to the discussion as well. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great question. Um, I, yeah, I think you, I think it's a couple of things. Uh, primarily, I do think Umbridge is a factor. Having a an active villain instead of a who's the villain makes a big difference. Mm. Um, a lot of the Harry Potter books, we don't really know who the bad guy is until the end. And, uh, you know, they, you know, who who was trying to put Harry into the, the Triwizard Tournament to get him murdered? Well, it was, you know, it was this guy. But he was in Polly just because he was disguised as this guy. You know, who was uh, trying to steal the Philosopher's Stone? Uh, we don't know. It could be Snape. It could be anyone. Uh, we think it's Snape, but we don't know. Oh, it's Quirrell. Okay, cool. You know, every with the exception of uh, the, the, the third one, which <laughs> the villain isn't present. And then turns out to not be the villain because it was also a bait and switch mystery. Mm. You know, we haven't had the gang in a situation where there's someone in the school that wasn't actively against them, and the the catharsis, well, the, so the frustration you feel reading this book from Harry's perspective of having no one believe him turn into a manifest, I should say, as a, as Umbridge. This incredibly villainous character, who, in my opinion, might be a better villain than Voldemort. I don't want to put that out there. I think Umbridge is a better villain than Voldemort in the long run. I don't think you would make um- an Umbridge a overarching villain of a story like this. But just in terms of like who I want to see Harry go up against, 
to Umbridge because she's in the mm. school. It's happening in the school. It's not a thing happening outside of the school. It's actively day to day affecting Harry. So we have this character that's literally in his life that's not leaving. That's outright villainous to the point where she's physically hurting him and making his life miserable and taking away everything he loves slowly from his you know from his relationships to his Quidditch to just everything just starts to crumble around Harry and then watching him pull that back through his interview with Rita Skeeter the outbreak at Azkaban starting to make people question the the, the prophet's event, events I just think there's something very satisfying about a, um, a story where we can engage with the villain openly and regularly and characterize them correctly, make them make Harry's life difficult. They're a proper antagonist throughout the year, not just for the final two chapters. And then, like, present him with all these obstacles. And then, of course, the beauty of Sirius' death and Harry's responsibility for that, which then plays into everything that follows it. Plus all of the plot revelations. Like, this book's got fucking everything. It's funny, it's got a great villain, active stuff. Then the ending is heartbreaking. It's partly Harry's fault, which is just a mwah, 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 chef's kiss all over the place. I did fucking I kiss the shit out of the book for that. Like, chef's kiss everywhere, everywhere for that. So good. Then we've got all the plot stuff. Dumbledore just, like, is a big expo dump on Harry. And we learn a ton of stuff that's really important to not just the, understanding the past and characterizing what's happened in the past, but the future where it's going so yeah i think i i think order of the phoenix is like an absolute linchpin of a book that manages to do all of that while being deeply entertaining um and how it does it is by being very large and taking its time with everything so it can die it can separate a lot of the darker stuff with you know ron trying to do quidditch which is objectively funny you know so uh, it's 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 hard to explain it as a as a as a uh, in a way that's not like uh, verbose like that because the book is so verbose it's so large so um but yeah it's it's it's, it's an extraordinary book and and i think probably the moment i thought the harry potter books would live forever mm. in pop culture when i read order of the phoenix i remember feeling that way i knew it had been a phenomenon but it could it was easily just as easily going to be a flash in the pan as anything but once I read Phoenix, I went, no, no, this she knows what she's doing. This is a really, really well put together story, and it's clearly going somewhere very specific. And it's, it's, you know, my 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 trust in where this was all going, and and, and her ability to tell this story so well was complete at that point. I was just like, no, this is this is gonna go down in history. Little did I know she'd potentially sully the legacy of this <laughs> this property. Um, you Cut to. Come- Cut to wizard shitting on the floor, um, which is just, I know, we've discussed before, it's just a sort of buy term I uh, used. Buy yeah, terms? I don't, I don't think, I think that, you know, people, people, people chat in holes in, in real life. I, she, she was, again, this is what this is, she was asked a question, like, what did people do in Hogwarts, a billion, you know, hundreds of years ago? Well, what everyone else did. I know, it's it's just, but like I say, it's become my byword for, yeah, yeah, for, for that. Um, uh, so, yeah. Um yeah, I. You know what? I I really struggle. Apart from Half Blood Prince, uh, which we've got next, which I have a very specific uh, story about, which I may or may not tell. Um, I can't. <laughs> I think by this by this point, I was just like, I can't. I can't remember the circumstances in which I saw this film. Um, no, I, can't I think this. I think the cinema, but I think by this point, I was like, oh yeah, cool. The movies, like fine. Um, but on, so like you, it, yeah. but when I also saw so it in excited, a cinema in a begrudging way. <laughs> I think I saw, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I didn't see them. I think I saw them all in the cinema apart from Half-Blood Prince, which again, we'll talk about next time. But yeah, anyway, um, but I went into this viewing really excited. Um, and you know what, guys, it's really good. It's still got problems, obviously, yep. but... There is some really great stuff here, and just mm-hmm. to see a consistent, clean narrative and an actual narrative where stuff is embedded throughout and isn't just scene to scene. Now we talked a lot last week. A lot of the problems with the kind of structure of Goblet of Fire is comes from and is inherited from the book, but just oh it was such a breath of fresh air like to have such a clean narrative where everything made sense and you didn't you weren't even sure 
like what it had cut because it just it just made such elegant, obvious cutting decisions and found a way to get whole chapters into moments through the use of the Daily Prophet, through the use of montages, through just so many clever story and filmmaking techniques. Because obviously, as well as Cloves um, being replaced for this film by, what was his name again? Michael something? Uh, hold on. Who, sorry, are we talking about Let's the director, see. David Yates? No, the writer. So the uh, writer, Michael Michael Goldenberg. Okay, as well as Cloves being um, replaced by Michael Glo- Golden, uh, Goldenberg, it was also, as Dan's just said, the first film by David Yates. And, you know, both of them just bring so much to this film that really make it work. Um, it was such a... It was, I don't know about you, but it was such a breath of fresh air watching this mm-hmm. film. Well, I think... Um, I, I think you know if you listen if you've listened to all of these so far you're gonna you know what we're about to talk about because it's been a factor as these books have gotten larger we we saw signs of it even in the shorter books weird mm-hmm. narrative bumps and we sort of landed last week when we finally got to the first really chunky book Goblet of Fire it became very obvious what the problem was and in a weird way it's sweet because what the actual problem is. He's too attached to the books, Cloves. That's the problem. He's too attached to the things that happen in the books and was not brave enough. And maybe partly a studio thing, actually. Let's not lay this at his feet, actually, completely. Because, actually, the studio may have been saying, oh, you can't cut that out. We've uh, we've done testing. And uh, this character is too popular to remove. <laughs> you know. Um, so maybe there could have been some of that that maybe backed off a little bit by the time we got to the, this one. They were a little bit less nervous about the franchise. It was doing very well, maybe by the time they get to this one. But either way, he clearly left things in that he didn't need to leave in, that took time and breathing space away from other things, leaving everything just feel segmented and fragmented, and you'd get set-ups without, set-ups without payoffs and all sorts of stuff. And there's a tiny bit of that in this, a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about that later. We're going to talk about who sent those fucking Dementos, because that's, that's my big gripe about this movie. We'll come back to it, because the answer is fucking incredibly good and... It would take two seconds to put in this fucking movie. I don't understand. Anyway, um, but I've got a list, Chris, of things cut out from this movie. And I've not Googled this. I, I wrote this as I was w- uh, watching. Do you want to hear all the things that are not in this movie? That when you when you hear, you'll go, oh, fuck, yeah. Yeah, I know. I've spotted some of them, but yeah, yeah go for it. Oh, no, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, dude, I wasn't just that you hadn't, but just to sum it all up in one sort of like brief moment here where I'll quickly go through them. Um, mm, the yeah, no, no. storyline about the final attempt to get the Quidditch Cup. So the Gryffindor never won it across their time with Harry on the team. This is Wood's last year and his last attempt to get the Quidditch Cup. And no, wait, is that? No, that's Azkaban. Because Ron yeah, replaces... Is- Ron replaces Wood. Yeah, he's they the still win it though. I think they win it in this book. They don't know. They, w- w- but yeah, they Harry, do. But Harry's I think this. I think I've mixed up the storyline about the last Quidditch World Cup. Needing to, you know, the, the last Quidditch Cup for Wood. That might have been Azkaban. But either way, this is Ron attempting to get on the Quidditch team. Mm. Um, this is Ron. Um, being the keeper. We are completely cutting Rita Skeeter and her interview with Harry. We're completely cutting um, Harry fighting with Malfoy and getting banned from Quidditch. Um, we're completely cutting Frenzy coming to the school to teach. We're completely um, skipping over Han and uh, Han? Han? Harry and Cho's original breakup, their whole visit to Hogsmeade, Mad- Mad- Madam Puddyfoot's tea shop. We've completely cut Marietta Edgecombe, who plays a huge part in this story. Um, Christmas on the Closed Ward is entirely gone. Percy's entire subplot is gone, including his letter to Ron about Harry. The entire Snape memory that includes a very key moment that is not here. Uh, Mundungus Fletcher is entirely removed. The use of the pensive is entirely removed. The entire story about Harry feeling... feeling um, also a little bit let down because he wasn't made a prefect when Ron was, so his jealousy around that is gone. It's not in the movie. Um, Creature's entire part in Voldemort's plan. Creature is actually part of Voldemort's plan in this movie, and it's not in this uh, in this in this story originally. Not in the movie. And then finally, that I've got on my list here is Trelawney's part in the prophecy. Again, not mentioned, not touched. Huge number of I... things removed. It's it's cra- and it's crazy how you just don't notice them. So uh, the two others which uh, you cut out a little bit, but I don't think you saw was um, obviously there's fines teaches divination for a bit, like after Trollery goes, 
Um, so that whole plot point's gone, and there's um, there's a lot more rooms in the Department of Mysteries, and a lot more sort of Department of Mysteries action mm-hmm. um, within that as well. And it, but you don't, you just don't. The, the thing is with with other films, like the Maundra's backstory is the big thing. You're watching it going. Why isn't this here? Because you've set up things which would be explained best through it. Mm-hmm. Um, it it feels like I'm coming to this with information that an audience just watching the film wouldn't have, and that feels like a bad thing. But with this, there's no, there's none of that. We only notice those things are missing because we're big fans of the book. It excuse me. It doesn't actually. They've managed to write the script in such a way and edit it in such a way because, you know, the the use of the profit and that that um, frameworking device to show mm-hmm. those headlines is a big part of this as well. They use all of those things yeah. to create a scenario where you don't miss any of those things for, uh, and the fact that they're not here. Whereas well, in the other films, you do. They're not do. set up. That's the thing. It's, it's, it's mm. the... Fra- like, if this was a... A clove script, we would have still gotten Ron trying to get on the Quidditch team, but it would have been done in like a minute and it would have been forgotten about. We would have done a moment where Ron and Hermione are made prefects and you'd be like, okay, where's that going? And it would have gone nowhere. You know, we would have had other... bits of all of these storylines, fragments of them scattered through the script and they wouldn't have gone anywhere, which would have been frustrating. Other changes are made, like the other amazing thing is there's changes that are made to not just because, not just things that are just not set up and removed, but changes that are made for the benefit of of the film and for the benefit of it being a, a, a you know a visual different medium. So, for example, a lot of the Neville stuff. So, yes, we don't have Christmas at the Close Ward, but instead we have this really beautiful moment where Neville, Neville and Harry look at the photo and talk about his parents. We have Neville finding the room of requirement and get a sense of what the DA means to him. Like, there's there's loads of changes like that. Where it just makes so much sense. Right. It's, so it's, oh, it's, it's, it's not only is it a change, but it's a change that enhances the stuff that this movie is focusing on. So why would we have... If we're, if we're going to take the time to do a bit of Neville stuff in this movie, which this movie does and does well, I think. Um, obviously, he doesn't... You know, he's not the lead. It's not, you know, Neville Longbottom and the Order of the Phoenix. But he gets a bunch of focus in this movie. So why have a random scene with Dobby turning up to help Harry find the room of requirement. Yeah. When you can give it to Neville and use that moment to enhance his story. It's like, it's just about yeah. knowing what to pare down. Dobby is fun as an inclusion in a book when you've got the time to do it because it's a book. <laughs> and like you be, and it keeps the world textured and it means that like all the characters are showing up all of the time, right? Um, and mm. that's fine. And that, and that works and it does. It makes the world feel very large you know in, in yeah. the in the in the books because of characters from other books just showing up for a for a brief moment but it doesn't need to happen here it doesn't need to happen in the movie and by giving that moment to neville you're in, you're you're giving more time for that character to have the story you're actually telling so it's it, it all it takes is for someone to sit down and go well what's the story overall that i'm telling what is not relevant to that well ron taking some time out to be a quidditch goalkeeper scrap why well, doesn't yeah. need to happen you know, multiple t- multiple doors with and a, and a room full of brains in the in the uh, Ministry of Magic not needed. Don't need it to tell the story, so it's gone. Things do we need, like do we, do we was... need Percy writing a letter to Ron that tells him to leave Harry to to not be friends with Harry anymore? No, <laughs> no. One um one other what example I thought was brilliant was the decision to make rather than it being Cho's friend that tells uh, yep. tells on Marietta the DA Edgar completely. It's, cut. It's it's Cho, and also what they do with Cho, they don't have the time to go into kind of her emotions and, and why she's so emotional and feeling upset, etc., and all of that stuff. So Hermione mentions it in a scene, but what they then do, the the twist and the change of making it, yeah, Cho told them, but also Cho was under the truth serum is is beautiful like it just it just wraps up the the harry and cho stuff maybe another scene you know maybe 
was needed there indicating that like you know yes. they're not going to be together but but they forgive each he forgives her uh, well he knows that she he has nothing to forgive her for maybe you could argue it needs that but in general as a change from the book so much more concise so much more logical it means it means you don't have to it means you have it you embed a new reason for Cho and Harry to fall out without all the relationship drama so Cho you're not spending the movie going well why isn't Cho with them I thought you know they were gonna they were gonna get together um so so much cleaner and there's so many examples of that throughout this film um mm-hmm. yeah i was just yeah i mean and and you know there is so to chuck in a because I, I started writing some notes but um and then uh stopped because i just got a bit too into it um but i will to i'll just occasionally chuck a little random one in um there are some things though this isn't a big one but where the fuck was Draco during Umbridge's first lesson? Crab and Goyle were there. <laughs> like, but Draco was just missing. And it kind of felt like, because Draco is inherently so connected to the Death Eaters through his dad, it felt like sometimes they were going, oh, it's weird if Draco doesn't, like, overhear hit this or make a comment or let's oh, just take him out of the scene. <laughs> like, <laughs> but, you know. Um, That's hilarious. So I know yeah. during the filming of this, a few of the kids were unavailable for certain sections while they did their exam. In fact, uh, there was a point, there was a point, there was a point when they, um, when, I, I don't know, it's not in the trove. Um, I, I know that Emma Watson and, and, and Harry and, Harry and uh, Daniel Radcliffe both had to take off, uh, I think a month from production, which basically shut it down because obviously they're the leads. But I wonder if someone like Tom Felton, um, let me just check his age versus them. Will he have been doing exam? Is he around the same age as them? So he's 34 now. Uh, what's Emma Watson's current age? If he's around the same age as her, she's 32. So, oh, he's the same age as, um, as Daniel Radcliffe then. So he would have been doing his A or AS levels at that time. Um, right, okay. So, yeah, I think I, I, it's possible that because he's not a lead, they didn't need to shut production down, but there's a couple of scenes where he would have been in the background that he was not in. I, I'm, I'm speculating there, though. I, I, I don't know. The, I don't. No, know no, that, that makes sense. Um let's the other as well as the fantastic narrative and script decisions the other thing this film has going for it mm-hmm. is it just really drills into the characters especially harry like yeah. it's, it's it's actually a character piece the the plot of this movie is not you know a bunch of stuff that happens to harry the plot of this movie is harry wrestling with whether he is turning into Voldemort, whether his anger is going to get the better of him, what he's fighting for, whether it's worth fighting. And that literally, you know, goes through peaks and troughs and comes to a conclusion, which brings all of those ideas and themes together. And we and, and that hasn't happened in one of the other films yet. The other films are just, these are the things that happened to Harry this year. Right. This is about what Harry learns and goes yep. through and how he grows this year. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah, I think. Um, it, yeah, for me, I think it's 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 like the the choice to make it a a character sturdy and and like to take even if you're using doing a scene that's pushing a plot point forward, you're using it to tell us something about the characters and and usually the script is so like trying to cram everything in, no scene can be about anything else. You know, no mm. <laughs> information, 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 story, narrative, story, narrative. But a uh, simple example. To sort of back up your point, Chris, and I, and I 100% agree with everything you just said, is is that moment with um, Seamus early in the movie. So um, Harry returns to Hogwarts and discovers that not all of his friends, you know, cohorts at the school, believe his story. It is far-fetched. He met the Dark Lord in a graveyard and that guy killed Cedric and he, you know, fought with him and escaped. It's a far-fetched story. You know what I mean? Like if I if I had that mm. fucking nonsense coming out of her. But then again, at this point, hasn't Harry fought like v- Voldemort versions of Vold- Voldemort like three out of his four years at Hogwarts or whatever? I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> at this point, maybe these kids should just accept that Harry's that kind of person. But anyway, but Harry solves Voldemort bullshit every year. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why. That no was the believes. original working title, I believe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, Harry Potter solves Voldemort bullshit every year, and the Philosopher's Stone was the original title. Um. Anyway, the. Uh, uh, you know, so Seamus doesn't believe him, and we have the plot moment downstairs to tell us what's happening in the world, which is that not everyone believes Harry, and that's Seamus turning on him. But that's obviously not a character moment. Seamus is a very minor character in these. But what we then get 
is the moment upstairs that follows it with Ron, which characterizes it. And that's, oh, that's so good, that scene. And let me tell you, Rupert Grint, throw a fucking Oscar. Because his hurt but understanding reaction to being snapped at by Harry is mm. absolutely exquisite. It's the best yeah, bit of him. acting he's done so far. And that's, you know what, and I've, I've, you know, we've complimented him a fair bit on this for his, you know, his comedic timing, his boisterousness. He's very good as Ron, but fuck me. <laughs> the puppy dog eyes he gives when Harry snaps at him. Oh. I, didn't, so I was waiting for the just... script to put it into words, but the script doesn't There's... do... That's the other thing. This script is so good, it's just showing us what's happening. Any other... But... A Steve Glow's script would have had a line later in where, where Ron's like, hey, you know you keep snapping at us and it's not great. Like, <laughs> and Harry would have been like, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But there's so but there's so many moments like that where and yeah. sometimes and and whether whether something like there's so many moments is of beautiful nuance in the performances and potentially the script but some stuff like this you don't know if it's performance script direction or a combination of all of them the work that Bonnie Wright is doing as Ginny in this yes. film and the decision to like right okay whenever we're just gonna the camera is going to pan over you. When you know there's a Cho reference, or you see, you know, like the the one on the bridge where Hermione says Cho couldn't stop looking at you, and we're just panning away anyway. But Ginny is looking annoyed, angry. It's giving us a hint of what's of you know what's to come, and her feelings for Harry, without ever feeling the need to force focus on it. Like it's just really subtle. In mm-hmm. like I say, I think that is a combination of potentially script, potentially directing, potentially acting. But the fact that I can't pin it down on one thing in particular shows how yep. seamless and brilliant it is. Like, yeah. and there's a lot of, and that's just, that's just you know, those are two examples. And it's a real combination of subtle nuances like that. And then also overt decisions to um, really put weight on, on things. I, I found I'd, just before, while I was um, you know prepping and waiting, I haven't looked at the full article, but I saw a, a Quora question. Um, and it basically said, is, any, uh, is the movie Order of the Phoenix better than the book? Now, to clarify, I don't think it's better than the book. But their yeah. first item, I've not looked at the rest, I might a bit later on, their first item, their first argument for that is Sirius hugging Harry at Grimnold Place. This is a heartwarming scene as Harry hasn't seen Sirius since the death of Cedric Diggory. At least in the film, this is the first time that Harry feels happy because previously up in his bedroom he gets annoyed with Ron. Da, 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 da. And actually, I think the point of this film takes Sirius and Harry and and goes, right, we need to really show the emotion and the connection between these two. Decisions like having come on James be Sirius's last words, as opposed to kind of the taunt of Bellatrix Lestrain as it is in the is in as it is in the book. I can't I can't I whether I completely agree with it, I don't know, but I can't deny that that's a very good argument for one quality where it's like, no, the film did do that very well. I've not read the book in a while to compare, but their treatment of Sirius and Harry is very deliberate and very plotted throughout and geared to enhance the ending. So, yeah. As opposed to something like last week where Cedric Diggory, so sim- exactly the same scenario in a way. The filmmakers of this film go, Sirius is going to die at the end, and Harry's going to witness that, so we really need to build Sirius and Harry throughout this movie and show their love and affection with, you know, hugs and real real visual representations of of their affection for each other that maybe weren't in the books, and we're going to consciously do that. Goblet of Fire last week, Cedric and Harry, Cedric is going to, Harry's going to watch Cedric die. It's going to be really cruel and heartless. And it's the first person Harry has seen die since his parents at the hand of Voldemort. And he's Hogwarts champion. And it's going to mean a lot. Cedric doesn't fucking say anything for the first hour or whatever of the film. Like, you can see the difference. <laughs> like, you, you just can. And what's crazy is. This is just what a film should be. Like, you, I think you said something really <laughs> profound before we started recording, which is that, like, the bar is just low that a competent movie is masterful. Because when you actually, you know, boil down what we're complimenting the movie, we're complimenting the movie for doing character work. 
<laughs> yeah. making the plot clean and uh, tight and sort of concise and, you know, introducing a character in scenes so that when they die, it means something. I mean, this is fucking... What, this is screenwriting for dummies. Like, what are we... <laughs> What are we doing? Like, what, the, no, no, the compliments no, no. we're praising this movie for, and they are compliments in the movie. I do think this is one of the better ones we've seen, for sure. But I do think, you know, in isolation, you go, God, that's it's pretty imperfect. I've got a bunch of stuff we'll talk about a little bit later that really doesn't work about this film. But on the whole, it's an absolute clear mile above Goblet, for sure. Um, we'll talk about where it lands in the... Um, in the overall rankings a little bit later, because I'm I'm a little torn about where this sits um, currently. But, I mean, yeah, it's, pr- it's pretty damn I mean, it's good. Nuts. It, is, it, is, it is nuts how I reacted to it, and especially watching them so close together, and, and, as, and to acknowledge again, the, the fault is not entirely at all at close for Goblet of Fire, and actually a lot of the faults carry over from the book. But watching them so close together, I can't tell you how excited the most basic of competencies had me, you know, loving the experience of watching this movie. Um, but it's, it is also about, you know, the, the performances, the char- the you know, the characters. It's about, you know, more than the writing. So let's talk, let's talk two incredible performances, also written beautifully. Uh, the first one, obviously, as in new perfor- new characters, the first one, obviously, Ivana Lynch as Luna Lovegood yes. is one of the most perfect bits of casting um, that this series, in a series full of amazing pieces of casting, yep. Ivana Lynch as Luna Lovegood is one of the most perfect. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's staggering. I actually think she's a better Luna than Luna comes across in the book because Luna in the book comes across aloof and it's only later on you realise she's actually quite wise and caring and very empathetic. I think that's something that comes in later whereas I think even when she's delivering her weird sort of I'm kooky lines you know, which could come across as look how crazy she is Mm. you know instead you already get a sense of her heart and her kindness and her warmth. But that's not on the page, I don't think. Not in those first few scenes. She's written as, oh, look, it's Looney Lovegood. Um, but actually, she brings a lot of warmth to it really early. Again, and that's a, that was a real pleasant surprise for me. And she's actually, honestly, in the end, she's the heart and soul of this film. She's who Harry goes to in two or three really key moments and has a conversation yes, with. Maybe not but, by choice, but fucking hell, it works beautifully. But the the heart and soul of the film that is in service to Harry and the overall right. theme and journey that the character of Harry goes on, like Correct. changes that script changes, like having Luna uh, introduce the Thestrals to Harry and explain them, um, and the bond that that gives them, and the you know the performance um, and the the way that her, both her and Radcliffe deliver their scenes together. It, it, it's all working amazingly, but again, I can't stress enough the difference is, as as we've already touched upon, the difference is right. How can we do a great job with Luna in service of of the wider story and the journey of the character? Whereas you know, in previous like Crumb, Crumb is not in service to anything. <laughs> you know, serious black stuff in Prisoner of Azkaban isn't in service to Harry's journey, which is why it seems so random when Harry gets excited about the idea of living with him. You know, it's it's all in service of the same thing. It's all tied together. Again, it is, you know, it's just, just generically good filmmaking, but, it you know, it's it's not as present as much in the films we've watched so far, at least, of as it is in this one. Um, and, yeah, Luna Lovegood, man. It's, it's just some really smart de- script decisions and a really wonderful subtle yet still in character performance um and obviously also and I'll, I'll let you take the lead on this one because um i know you're such a fan of the character but uh professor umbridge um what a great performance and great writing there as well yeah i mean i'm so glad that you were going to mention umbridge because you said there were two characters and obviously i think there was no question that we were going to chat very fondly of uh ivana lynch and her uh, you know, interpretation of, of of Luna, who's a really important part part of this puzzle. Uh, but I was very worried you were going to compliment um, <laughs> fucking 
what's her face? Johnny Deppin around the place. What's her name? Helena Bonham Carter as 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 uh, oh god, Bellati- Bellatrix look crazy. You know she really is no, her, I, that. Yeah, and, I remember her you know, performance. Like I remember her performance being like a bit better in the later films, which we'll see if that's nostalgia and memory. But yeah, it was a little. Uh, OTT, well, we, shall we say in this? Well, 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 Chris, let's not get off the let's not get off the hype train right now. We're lathering this 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 bad boy with compliments. Let's let's well, let's get the bile out right at the back end. This, I've got some. I have got some pretty severe criticisms of some elements of this film. While it hasn't affected my overall enjoyment of it, and I'd still say this is probably one of the better ones. Um, well, let's push that to the back. Let's talk about fucking. Bangalore Carter later. Let, right now, let's talk about the incredible performance we get for Umbridge. Um, Umbridge is a really hard character to do in live action, in my opinion, because the book can tell you that very easily with words, well, she's talking very sweetly, but then use the what what she's saying to outright be obviously evil. You know? It's not a it's 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 not hard where you write evil words but say she's saying them sweetly. You know, anyone can add <laughs> said in her sweetest voice or whatever to the end of a sentence. Doing that in live action and finding someone who could be villainous while also being this, like, over-the-top pink explosion (laughs) with this, like, very... I'm so sorry, Dumbledore. I I may have misheard, but I believe you were suggesting, you know, that the Ministry might have been involved. Like, this, this, this absolutely incredible sort of, like, you know, holier than thou somehow... But also, you know, um, but also, like, I just so deeply evil. Um, and they found Imelda Staunton. Now, I, um, my, my understanding is she was always pick first pick for this role. Um, and I can see why. I, at the time, I remember as a, as a uh, fan of Doctor Who, I was hoping it would be, what's the name of the main Slovene from the first series of Doctor Who? What's that actress called? I know who you mean. I don't know the, the actress's name, but yes, I know who you mean. Uh, and she would have been a great choice too. What's that, sorry? I was just saying, I can't remember her name, but I know who you mean, and she would have been a great choice too. She, yeah, she uh, she was my choice for, for... Let me see, I've got it here. Doctor Who, World, what was it called? World War Three. Oh, God. Yes. Uh, it's going to kill me, so I'm going to have to quickly look it up. She but was anyway. uh, World War Three, Aliens of London, and she was also in Boomtown as well. Yeah, here we go. Uh, Seems Doctor Who actress. Here we go. This will do it. This will do it, Chris. This Google search has got the correct terminology. Margaret Blaine. Thank you, Margaret Blaine. Thank you, Google. Um, this podcast is not an ad for Google. Google are terrible. Um, <laughs> um, well, the search engines are available. Yeah, although they're also pretty bad. <laughs> what are you going to do? Use Bing. <laughs> that's that's what my, that's Google's marketing now. Should just be Google. We're evil, but what are you going to do? Use Bing. <laughs> um, Jeeves is word, dead. No, of course not. Anyway, Umbridge. Jeeves died of old age years ago. Google it, you prick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Margaret Blaine was would have been my choice going into it, and I didn't really know Imelda Staunton. So when she was cast, I must admit, just you know, young Dan, disappointed it wasn't who I wanted. Um, but my God. My God, does she hit every note perfectly? The stiffness, that sort of st- like that stare that makes it like you know she's while she's saying sweet things, her eyes are basically saying, "I want to rip you apart limb from limb." Because I, she's just—I don't know how she exudes evil so much. Because I will say, one of this script's deficiencies is I don't think Umbridge is evil enough on paper in this script. She does, she does the, she does the hand thing with the pen. And she makes Hogwarts not fun anymore. Sort of. But even that's vague. So on the page, yeah. this umbridge isn't actually really as quite as nasty as the book incarnation. And No, I think I think a really effective scene for that that's again very clever writing, because it doesn't even particularly involve her character, is having the Nigel character cry and Fred and George comfort him. Knowing that, you know, someone that young, 
she's made sit and write and cut into their hands and all of that sort of stuff is helps her seem more evil. But yes, I think it's fair to say she's more evil in the books than she is on the page in this film. I want to add a question to our questions now of what's Nigel up to this week? You know how we ask a question? Don't we ask the questions of the film? Is there enough Wizard School in my Wizard School movie, etc.? Is there, you know, what's Nigel up to? You say that, but I think the problem is the answer for the next two weeks will be the next three weeks will be nothing. He's not there, and uh, we don't forget we did promise Percy watch, and it turns out Percy watch is just if there's someone from the Ministry of Magic in a scene, Percy's in the background. <laughs> yeah, hinting without making it part of the story, like to the point he's so subtle that it would not surprise me for someone to go. Percy wasn't in that, was he? That's a shame. <laughs> Yeah, completely. Because he's in the he's in the Harry he's in the Harry trial scene, but he's yep. literally just sat there, like. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but they well, they never at any point verbalize it. Uh, anyway, um, yeah. So I, I I you know I think Imelda Staunton has to do an awful lot to make this Umbridge feel like you know Hogwarts is Darth Vader, you know, because at the end of the day, she's. She doesn't get as much screen time as she gets time in the book to just continuously barrage the children with horrible things. Mm. You know, she's Mrs. Trunchbull. Uh, that's a good. That's a good analogy from Matilda. And I think, you know, um, you just have what you, when you have a lot less page time, you've really got to sell it and sell it quick. And it's just incredible how they do it with this. And and, and it, is, it is, you know, primarily what she delivers. Um, and again, it's just, oh, I don't know if it's all in the eyes, but honestly, when she stares at some of the characters or looks at the characters, oh, you just feel her brain, like she's just trying to use her brain to make their heads explode. <laughs> I don't know how you get that vibe from it, but it, you do. It's great. But again, though, they, they, they also make it work with clever narrative and editing choices. The use of montages in this film, especially for her character... Yes. It's phenomenal because it's like, right, we need to show that the children hate her and that she's tormenting them. Okay, we'll have some montages. Montages where we show that. Like, it's just... It's and even just it's, simple it's weird little fr- framing choices as well. Like, there's a bit where the kids are coming back from school... Uh, not from school, from Hogsmeade, where they've had their meeting about this Defence Against the Dark Arts group. And instead of showing you know, someone who was there whispering in her ear or whatever, the camera just pans up and staring down at them from a, like an uh, like a balcony, perfectly framed in the centre, Umbridge looking menacing, looming over the children. It's brilliant. It's just doing it with visuals. I mean, okay, sorry, let me take the business. It's competent. It's filmmaking. <laughs> Tell us in the visual. I'd imagine <laughs> the, the use of the signs as well. Like, I imagine David Incredible. Bradley, like nearly fell out of his chair when he saw this script and was like, oh shit, I've got stuff to do. Like, I've properly got, like, stuff to do in this movie. That's cool. Like, I'm not just there. Well, yeah, he's decided like... to join the podcast. He's just come up and literally meowed into the microphone. Um, oh, nice. Hi, Walt. How you doing, buddy? He just wants to be well, actually there. Professor McGonagall. <laughs> well, that's weird, because I'm currently stroking him. <laughs> That's Walt is Dad's cat, for those that couldn't have guessed that. Um, yeah, Walt yeah, is like, so... a weird flatmate I have that likes to meow sometimes. <laughs> but there's so there's so many devices. There's the montages um, like pinpointed by the signs. There's the yes. montages pinpointed by the Daily Prophet headlines. There's the, I assume, the I, use I, of I, dreams. I, just say you kind of, I assume you mean punctuated by... <laughs> what am I saying? Pinpointed? Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, punctuated. I don't really, I just um, don't really know what that would mean. The, <laughs> the, yeah, no, 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 that's fair. Um, and uh, and the dreams, and the dreams way of getting us from one scene to another, yes. and the, the dreams being a motif that occurs throughout. There's just there's so many clever decisions. Um, and yeah, I agree about Umbridge. I think um, she's the perfect choice. Let's, uh, shall we, shall we then, shall we use Bellatrix to take us into things that we, uh, we weren't quite as fond of. Yeah, right. Gave her a hey, everyone. She's crazy. <laughs> She's so... She is so crazy. Lucius oh. Malfoy is going to be all like, hey, kids, we don't want to hurt you. We're not going to hurt you. No, we're not interested in that this time. I know we're the bad guys. All we want is that orb thing that you have no interest in and is basically valueless to you and we will literally let you go. Nothing. No problem. Just off you trot. 
But we're definitely going to kill you! Because I'm menacing! <laughs> oh, I just get the shit out of my cat. <laughs> He's not here anymore. <laughs> um... <laughs> um what the fuck? Like, what? Okay, so in the last movie, I talked about how Dumbledore has no chill. In this movie, Bellatrix has no chill. And I think w- maybe Bellatrix needs to not be the person you bring to this kind of negotiation. <laughs> and look, I get it. Yeah. Also, they are surrounding the children with masked Death Eaters, and it's obviously a threatening situation. But Bellatrix, maybe just wait till Lucius has tried to end this peacefully and not have to murder a bunch of children. But it's such a. Before. It, it, it really. <laughs> It really undercuts Jason Isaacs and Lu- and the Lucius's performance because you don't yeah. know whether to believe him or not. You don't know whether he's telling the truth or whether he's just going to kill those kids the yeah. minute he's got the orb. And that's it, brilliant. In isolation, threat- I think you'd believe him. I think he sells it sincerely. I think he was told by the director or by someone, we think our interpretation of this script is that we think Lucius is being sincere here. He just wants the orb. He doesn't want to kill a bunch of children because who does? Even the bad guys, that doesn't benefit anyone. Right now, Voldemort's trying to stay under the radar, remember? The whole point is that Voldemort is enjoying sowing seeds of dismay and doubt, right? So even just taking the moral killing children thing out of it, because he didn't exactly seem reluctant to Vada Kedavra Harry in chamber. So like, even if you take that out of it, I think he's being sincere at that moment, because he just has no interest in having a bloodbath at the Ministry. That it, that benefits no one. But you you don't know that, because of what happens with <laughs> Helen Von Carter's performance. Because if you haven't figured it out, guys, she's crazy. They also... Is it me? And I might need to pull it up to rewatch it. But I certainly felt this watching it. I nearly choked um, on the my team then. I'm so angry. It... <laughs> Is it me, or does she run away as well? Yep. Like, which yep. just seems so out of character compared to how the character is characterised in the books. Like, she wouldn't leave Voldemort on a, on his own to fight Dumbledore. Good she would question. be there. What does she do yeah. in the book? You you carry on talking. I'm going to quickly check because I'm you you made a very good point. I don't recall her being there for the battle that ensues, but I also don't recall her running away. So you you carry on. I'm going to quickly check. That's a that's a good point. And it is, you could, uh, let me double check the, let me, let me watch the tape, because I don't know whether... No, no, she does, she, 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 you're exactly right. Harry chases her, Voldemort sort of starts to appear, and she goes, no, mm, my... you're in trouble now, and then she like jumps into the fire and vanishes. My thing was going to be whether you could interpret it that Voldemort like sends her away, but I don't think oh, you, I I don't think you could. Yeah, yeah, I guess, okay, so I've got the Department of Mysteries chapter here. It's not that chapter. Yeah, and I've got the clip from the film. So it's be- no, it's that's Beyond the Veil. That's the next one for obvious reasons. The only one he ever feared. This is it, right? Yeah, so this is yeah, the one with yeah. Harry. So it starts with Harry denying Sirius is dead. Here we go. You've got it, Potter. Are you going to give it to me, Axio? Prophecy. Oh, this is the stuff about the prophecy. Uh, oh, it's around here. Okay, here we go. I can't find any mention of her name on this page, so she's clearly already gone here. In the film, there's a scene of Dumbledore like casting a spell, and then she slides backwards into there and goes. So I, yeah, it's definitely played like she's running away. I think. Oh, here we go. Yeah, basically, she, the last thing it looks like is he, he Voldemort's because the he Voldemort finds out the prophecy has been destroyed, and he, you know, she's saying that she did. She, you know, he's saying she let her down. And she says to Voldemort, you know, Master, you, you know, she's pleading with him. He's like, quiet, Bella, I'll deal with you in a moment. You know, um, I didn't enter the right. ministry to hear your sniveling apologies. Um, right. And then they leave. And then do they leave together then? So she's put out and it's is just sort of. Watching no, no, no. Then then, then she's trying to tell him that, you know, she says he is here. He is below referring to Dumbledore. But Voldemort's too interested in Harry at this point. And then Dumbledore shows up and those two fight. And I can't see any mention of Bellatrix. So I guess the implication is she slips out in that moment. Although that's kind of right. weird. It's or does she just a hover around watching events until... until I it don't seems, know. Yeah, seems like it. Oh, the... here she goes. No, no. She's, she, yeah, she sticks around watching events. Because here she is later on after his, Voldemort has dealt a blow from uh, Voldemort yelling master so she yeah she sticks around and watches the fight and I guess leaves when he leaves there you go leaves when he leaves okay so yeah so yeah that characterization is is weird Um, there's also one positive related to Bellatrix though 
I like that we see the the escape from Azkaban. Like that's a really cool mm-hmm. thing you can do in a film that you just you yeah. that, that you you can't do as much in the book because it's I, mainly Harry's perspective. I do potentially but, yeah, have a criticism cool. associated with that though. So we talked about don't put in the setup if you're not really going to pay it off or use it, right? The mm. escape from Azkaban has to be in the this story, I guess. But <sighs> What do they do with it? Because its purpose in the book is to start to change people to Harry's side. Because partial, well, one of the part, the, the the elements of it is people start not believing the prophet's story because a mass breakout of Azkaban seems so unlikely. They start going, "Well, wait a minute, maybe Voldemort is back." All of a sudden, his guys are getting broken out. It it, it starts to sow doubt in the magical well, community as to the prophet's veg events. And then the other effect it has is it if it impacts the Neville story um, and has him sort of fighting harder because he knows his parents killer or not killer but yet the, the person who tortures his parents into insanity is out there and then it has this feeling of ominous you know it, it, it doesn't initially but it eventually leads like this kind of ominous feeling at the school where everyone doesn't feel safe this mass breakouts going on it's starting to affect the mood of the wizarding world none of that's in this movie so could mm, you just, have... they do a they do a version of both of those things i'd argue like neville neville is the one reading the paper who closes it and looks ominous and looks sad and that the immediate next scene it, after neville puts down the paper is seamus saying to harry even my mum can't believe what's going on now. I I believe you. It's Seamus coming around. Mm. Okay, yeah, maybe to a point they do. I just don't know, because there's a part of me that thinks, like, if that's not in the movie at all, the breakout, do you question Bellatrix being out? She just She's one of Voldemort's lackeys. He's got her out of prison. You wouldn't. You just sort of assume, right? Because I also yeah, think there's, I... A, there's a, the problem this movie creates, and this is a problem the movies have created for themselves, a mass breakout of Azkaban. Well, we didn't kill Barty Crouch Jr. So where the fuck's he? They sent him to Azkaban. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, we yeah, as we said that we said that last week. Like that's that's crazy. And and we also predicted we were correct about how the fact that Moody wasn't Moody in the last movie, but is Moody in this, just isn't addressed. And those are yeah, absolutely false. But I think it's all in. I, I think because it's all in service of Harry's story. Even though it's, you know, only really Seamus says he doesn't believe him at the beginning and then he says he does believe him after the breakout, that that tension of everyone not believing him and the frustration that causes Harry, it all adds. I, I think I think they do enough and it, it works enough because it links, they link the breakout back to that because, mm. like I said, it's, it's the very next scene and it's the thing that Seamus says, I wanted to apologise and I've got it here. Uh, I wanted to apologise. Uh, not even my not even my mum says the prophet's version of things don't add up now. What well, he doesn't say now, but don't add up. And then he says, "So what I'm really trying to say is that I'm sorry." So mm. yeah, or maybe he says, "I believe you." I paused it and didn't actually get no. Yeah, he says, "I believe you." Um, so yeah, I th- I think they do. I think they do enough with that. The moody thing and the Bar- Barty Crouch thing is just like yeah. But here's the thing: it, right? uh, if I'm if indicative I'm, look, of problems look, with the movies, look, David Tennant won't have been easy to get to, right? At this point, he's doing Doctor Who full time now, right? We know that. But let's be honest: the fight at the end of this movie, just to have him be part of that group as just one of the gang. Mm. That wouldn't have been hard to achieve, right? Get David Tennant in for a couple of days shooting. Because I just think, like, yeah, okay, it's not in the book because Crouch is because because he's he's I believe he's dead, right? Oh no, he's they suck his soul out, don't they? That's right. The Dementors yeah, get to the him Dementors, in the book, the Dementors, which they don't cover. So he's just gone. He's just gone to ask about. I, I think that's fine. I like. I you know. It, it, look, there are so many fucking characters in this movie that are just like. Just part of the crowd. Like when the Order of the Phoenix come to get Harry. I'm like, I think that's supposed to be all fire Doge. But he doesn't say a word. So well, that's and just you are, random you, wizard you number are, four, I guess. You're right, because in a world where you have in a world where you have Barty Crouch alive in the world yeah. of the movies, why not take the opportunity to not have those faceless, nameless, we don't know who they are, Death Eaters yeah. in that fight, but take the opportunity to have it be Barty Crouch. Yeah, 
He doesn't need a storyline. He doesn't need anything. Just to have him be one of them. And you'd go, oh yeah, I, I, I get that guy. I know his motivation. I understand who he is from the previous thing. <laughs> and then if, you, if you're worried about that being too big a change, one of the auras can kill him. Sure. Oh, yeah. What? Why not? They have some stakes on either well, side. Yeah. Well, this, Great. Well, mate, there's a really obvious, there's a really obvious choice there, isn't there? Have Moody kill him. <laughs> Fucking perfect. Yeah. Oh my god, Chris. Chris. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Beautiful. I like that. Um. Uh, so if we're on the subject of of things that I'm not sure do work in this thing, mm. let's talk about Dementors, Chris, because. Uh, in a movie where I'm not sure Dolores Umbridge does as much as she does to be truly evil as she could have. Why would you set up the mystery and really set up the mystery of where those Dementors came from and then just Mm. not answer it? Now, I think the actual answer is they put it in and went, well, everyone will just assume it was Voldemort, so that's enough of an answer, right? But the actual answer is more interesting and better and helps villainize a character we already know is villainous. Why can't what is the Umbridge actual answer? I can't, had... I can't remember the nuances of that. What is the actual answer? The actual answer is that Dolores Umbridge, seeing Harry openly talking about Voldemort returning, decides someone needs to shut him up and discredit him. She's the one who sent the Dementors to Little Winging. Hmm. Yeah, I don't That's... know why you wouldn't include that. It's genius. It's the perfect answer to the mystery of why the Dementors were there. Because, you know, the other answer, and the other, and the answer I'm assuming most people who watch this movie just assume it is, is that, you know, the Dementors are just back under the control of you-know-who, and that's fine. Voldemort being in control of the Dementors is fine, although they don't do the setup for that either, because the, because the, 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 the Goblet of Fire book ends with Dumbledore giving Cornelius Fudge some advice, some of which is, go fetch the Giants, and maybe end your dealings with the Dementors they're about to turn on you. <laughs> so, you know, the fact Dementors you, end up and, in the little whinging, a, even without the Dolores Umbridge explanation, makes a lot more sense in that context. There's such an easy way of doing it, isn't there? Like, you at the end, where she's yelling at the centaurs, and maybe even, maybe even, you, you have Harry and Hermione look like they're going to help her, and then she's and she yells at the centaurs... Um, you should stay away from me. I've got the Dementors un- under my control. And at that point, Harry looks at her and he was like, "And he's like, what? What do you mean you've got the Dementors under your control? She's like, well, I sent them to you, didn't I? Or something. You know what I mean? Better yeah. written than what uh, I've just honestly, spouted off the top of my it, head. It, it, but it, it doesn't matter. Like, it, anyway, she could have done it later in the in the story. You know, someone has to shut you up, you little, na- you, you know, you nasty little shit. Like, I, I've already tried it once. It well, I just think work, that's you know. uh, that... That that being her climax, that being her last moments, apart from like the headline on the prophet, is is a is a good is a good villain reveal at the end right. of the villains. Perfect. Storyline. Like just have yeah. Sh- I don't care the context. It's it's it cannot. It only needs to be a line or two. If if the reveal of Umbridge's connection to that sending the Dementors after Harry, you know, to help Fudge and discredit him, uh, discredit Harry and Dumbledore was like a big complicated thing that would take multiple scenes to establish and clarify. No problem. Voldemort did it. Don't care. But it's such an easy win. It's like one sentence. Why mm. not keep it? So mm. it, it, it's a frustrating experience in that sense because I think that is a hint of a, a small uh, a version of what we got on mass in the previous movie. You know, setups without payoffs. But at least this one, I suppose... You can assume an answer. You know, Dumbledore implies it in the in the Ministry courtroom. He says, you know, well, I, you know, if you, you know, if we've spoke on this matter, Fudge, you know, if 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 you're claiming you're fully in control of the Dementors and they were there, then we must accept the possibility you're not fully in control of your Dementors, which is fine. And and and, and like anyone who comes out of the movie thinking Voldemort did it because the Dementors aren't under the Ministry of Control anymore, fine. That's a, yeah, that makes sense. It fits. It doesn't need to be a mystery. But I just think it's such a good way to both solve a mystery and make a villainous character even more villainous. And I, it's such a satisfying answer in the book. And it's such a shame. And again, because it, the payoff only would take a sentence or two to, to, to put into your script, I really don't know why you wouldn't. Um, it's such an easy win. So yeah, that, that's a frustration. I do, do have one of the... Oh, go on. No, okay, go on. 
No, no, I, 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 honestly, I'll rant all day about the couple of things that because the couple of things that bothered me really bothered me. But go on, I want to hear. We'll split it do, up. Do you want my I'll, I'll one on. of my small ones? One of my small Please. ones. They and I, I believe they do this elsewhere in the later movies. I think there's a particularly egregious one in the final film. But sometimes these films have a habit of putting the same line from the book in, even if it doesn't work in context of the film. <laughs> so in the book, bu- in the book, Harry is yelling, actually yelling, so it makes sense when Fred and George say, (laughs) we thought we could hear your dulcet tones. In the film, he's not fucking yelling. Like, because actually, the film does that quite well. Harry's slow build to the point where he yells, look at me at Dumbledore, is brilliant. But if that's the case... Don't have Fred and George say about his dulcet toes if at that point he's not actually yelling at anyone. Yeah. I was like, I know I, that's a great line from the book, but it doesn't make sense here, movie. <laughs> I, I don't know whose choice this was, this Harry choice to build to that moment. Uh, beautifully performed by Daniel Radcliffe, by the way. The, the power mm. in the look at me line is just fantastic it's just mm. top tier acting like i i mean look it shouldn't be a surprise to any of us you take three kids that can act ish and you stick them in a movie where they're constantly surrounded by the best of british acting for several years shocker they can all act now like yeah yeah it would tend to rub off on you wouldn't it <laughs> working mm. with all the greatest most talented actors in the country but anyway um, mm. daniel radcliffe uh, you know not to take anything away from the work they must have put in to achieve that but i'm just saying like it's it shouldn't really have surprised as they developed into great actors considering their circumstances <laughs> um, mm. but yeah uh, he, he, i don't know whose choice it was whether in the script it was like harry is quietly seething at grimald place builds to frustrated and then builds to anger but in the book it's a very different choice but this is again this is me gonna go ahead and prove that in the book doesn't always mean i prefer the book this is totally always and always has been room for me for interpretation i'm happy for changes as long as they make sense for the version that we're getting and it's consistent with itself and the choice to make the so the book harry we've already talked about this does differ from movie harry he's less arrogant than book harry and we've, I've actually, I, I seem to feel like, I, I feel like we've mentioned that multiple times across these podcasts where we've said, oh, in the book he did this, which was a more arrogant move than this, uh, you know, and pointed out examples of that. So it makes perfect sense that a less arrogant version of this character wouldn't jump to anger so quickly for being left out of the loop. He's still a little bit arrogant. He still says, you know, I've done stuff. I've, I'm, I've fought Voldemort. I'm the one who did it. Can I, I, why am I not involved? But it's not coming from quite the same place. So it's a, it's a really interesting character choice that fits much better with the version of the character we've had in the movies. Now, I don't know who, you know, whether there was that much thought put into it or whether Daniel Radcliffe just chose to play it subtler and build it because he really wanted the power of the look at me moment. I'm really not sure how it played into it, but it actually works beautifully whether by choice or by accident it fits in so well with this interpretation of that character yeah um, and i really I enjoyed that yeah i think it's brilliant it's actually the uh it's actually and i might just skim them now it's actually the second thing on this uh why the film is better argument uh building harry's anger to up progressively instead of being at being already being at its height you know uh but again it wasn't dulcet tones change that line for fred and george uh, then they've got having Luna introduce Harry to the Thestrals instead of Hagrid. I agree with that one. That's a really good one. Having Neville find see, the room of I, requirement. Can I ask you a question about that before we carry on? Because while we're on that subject, what, mm. don't put Hagrid in the movie then. Does Hagrid no, need sorry, to be in the movie? Uh, well, yeah, because the, the, you kind of have to... I, I potentially, to be honest with you, would have put... I suppose Gwarp is relevant to their plan at the end to get rid of umbridge but, but what if, but what if, what if, what if just, isn't what if they're out in the woods they see the centaurs and they find out the centaurs are riled up yeah. with the ministry and hermione's plan is to take umbridge to the centaurs knowing they're mad at the ministry and that they'll maybe yeah. be not happier with her and that will give them the opportunity to escape can that and you could plan? have hagrid you could just have hagrid in the mood well, but you could just have Hagrid in the movie explaining that, or he's gone for the whole thing, but then it becomes the next movie's problems. I suppose there's a no, conversation no, I mean, of, a, a, there's a conversation of, are we going to have giants turn up in the last movie? Do we need to explain where they've come from? But probably not. I don't think. Like, well, that's, that's yeah, the I think thing. He, like have have Hagrid show up in the next movie and be like, hey, I, I was gone for a year looking for giants. 
Because um, when that scene happens, where when the ha- Hagrid explains where he's been, it did feel that was a point where I was like, it feels like that everything has slowed a bit to get this scene in because it needs that. Felt like what we were talked a lot last week about mm-hmm. where the filmmakers are going. It's in the book, so it should be in this, right? And I, 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 I just I, I, you know, n- not to be like go further, cut more, but you know. I really don't know if we need Grawp or Hagrid in this movie. And look, I love Robbie Coltrane and I love his version of Hagrid, but he doesn't really add anything to this movie or to the themes of the movie or the story they're telling. He adds to the narrative in a way that could be written around. I do really enjoy that Grawp scene, though. Especially yes. his no, relationship it's very with fun. Hermione. It's, it's very, and, and, and yeah. I guess it's, it's less vindictive. Is it? What's more vindictive that Hermione takes Umbridge to a giant it's probably going to hurt her. Or Hermione takes Umbridge to the centaurs that are probably going to hurt her. <laughs> I'm not sure which. Because mm. um, they even they even go to the effort of embedding that. Like, yep. we see them run and Hagrid says the centaurs are fed up with their boundaries bit getting taken. Like, it's brilliant. Um, mm. Yeah, this list. So Neville finds the room of requirement. I agree. I think that's a great move. Cutting the Quidditch session a season, I agree it's a great thing for this movie. I don't think it makes it better than the book because you kind of need to have Quidditch every year. It is a school year after all. Uh, use of montages, I agree with. Harry and Cho's relationship, that could be a good chance to talk about this. Do you think? How do you think that was handled? Do you think that in general was handled well? Yeah, I think so. I, I agree with what you said earlier that it probably could have used some sort of line at the end to show mm. like a like a like a mutual understanding. You know, uh, a certain like, hey, look, this this kind of imploded, and I'm sorry for my part in that, and I'm sorry for assuming the worst in you. I mean, admittedly though, Cho probably could have just gone to the trouble of saying, you know, I was under Veritas serum, right? Like, I don't think, I don't think anyone would have doubted Umbridge's capacity to po- poison the students. You know, like, mm-hmm. uh, who would have believed Umbridge over her? I, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like Cho missed a trick, not just saying, "Hey guys, I'm really sorry," but she literally poisoned, like, she truth served me. Well, I think <laughs> it's, I think it's, I think it's played that we don't know that's what's happening. She's feeding them, but it's not overtly clear she's poisoning them until Snape says it at the end. Right, 100%, but I'm just saying from the perspective of the story, it's weird. It's a weird sort of, like, logic contrivance that, like, I feel like most characters, if not all characters in that situation, would say that's what's happened. Because it feels like she goes to Umbridge specifically and gets Veritaserum. Because Veritaserum isn't like a slow poisoning thing. You get fed it and then get immediately asked the questions. You know, that's how Veritaserum works. So she was obviously taken to Umbridge's office, was forced to drink something or tricked into drinking something. um, And then spilled the beans. Because Umbridge shows up with, you know, with Cho when she goes to the Room of Requirement. It's It's like it's almost immediately just happened. So I feel like Cho would at that point have gone, ah, I think I've been, why did I just blot out the truth? Oh, I guess I just got Veritas serumed. And then, you know, maybe not in that moment, but then maybe the next day find some of the members of the order and be like, guys, I'm so sorry. She, she tricked me. I'm really sorry. Like I wouldn't just like, you know, it's a bit of a contrivance that she then doesn't have that conversation with Harry. Or even tries like I think she goes to try and talk to him when they're coming out of the hall, coming out of the detention. But even giving her a line of dialogue along the lines of "Look, I'm pretty sure she," and then they choose to ignore her, and she's kind of like, because then also you kind of get the closure of the relationship because essentially you could either have Cho have a look because that actress is brilliant. So you either maybe have her have a look that suggests, well, if you don't want to even talk to me, we're done, or you know she could say that to someone, or do you know what I mean? Yeah, this just, it's missing something. I think the Harry Cho relationship mm. in the closure end of the of the spectrum. I think the 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 way it's built, it builds up um, is is nice. Uh, Hermione's Cho couldn't take her eyes off you. Line feels a bit. It's it's forced in and out of nowhere in the moment, but it's a nice line that does a lot for that relationship. And Harry's little smug smile when she says that. You know, building up to the kiss, which is good. The little chat they have after it, which is one of my favorite bits in the book. When Hermione describes all the emotions that Cho's feeling, and mm. Ron, said, Ron says, one person can't feel all that. They'd explode. And Hermione says something like, you know, not, not everyone has the emotional range of a teaspoon or something like that to Ron. It's a great little exchange. I really enjoy it. Um, 
you know, all of that stuff's really fantastic. It's just that the it's not clear at the end of this movie that they're not a couple anymore. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. I think it needs the apology scene. It needs mm-hmm. something like that. The just how, looking how at the rest. Of, what is, I mean, I don't know. You're you're the love. You're the love guy. You love love. How, what did uh, you, you got anything to add on that? Because you asked me the question, but actually, this probably should have been a question for you about Joe and Harry and how it's handled. Uh, well, Joe Ch- and Harry, I don't have anything more to say in a way than what we have. Mm-hmm. Like the the, I think it's missing that apology scene, but the but the build up to it, as you've just said, is really nice. If we're if we're talking loving love, though, I think the. You know, the films have set up a world, especially with um, some of the stuff in Chamber and then the stuff in Goblet. I, I My memory was that they did a lot more Ron Hermione stuff, like in the build-up to Deathly Hallows. And maybe there's... Well, there's my memory there's, of half the Prince. There'll be a ton in the next one. T- yeah, there's teenage love crap all over the place in that movie. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I was surprised to see... I almost felt more of a presence of Ginny's feelings for Harry than Ron and Hermione's for each other in this film. Um, yeah, which is in fine. This film, like, but do you not think we were surprised at how much of it was in Chamber and Azkaban? Like, they might have. Yes, yeah, so that's what I mean. So I'm surprised that didn't. In this, but there was so I'm surprised much they fairly didn't, early. I'm surprised they didn't f- like continue that as well. It, it all, it's almost like this movie kind of forgets about that side of things a little bit, apart from maybe Ron's jealousy at um, Corp, which is amusing because he's jealous of wait, this yeah, huge sorry. giant. <laughs> They did it in. They know they did. They, it's every movie but this one because they did it in Goblet of Fire too. There's been a Harry. So there's been a. That's what I'm saying. It's moment. weird. Yeah, to, it's, yeah, yeah, okay. Because I was weird thinking that it's not back in this movie. Yeah, sorry. No, no. I don't. But in my head, I was going. You're right. It's been two movies since they've done anything with those two. But that's not true because they had the whole Yule Ball stuff in the last one. So I, I was. I was making i was agreeing with your point and going yeah it's been a little while they did do it but they didn't do it early enough but yeah this movie definitely drops the ball on that for sure yeah especially when it kind of crescendos at, at yule ball and then crescendos again in half blood prince i I would have thought they'd have kept a bit more momentum on mm. that side of things going um I'd, i've somehow started so i'll finish there's only a few more on this list but serious comforting harry with the black family tree I think it's a great thing of the movie. I don't think it makes it makes it better than the book. And also, actually, yeah, no, because that's also Half-Blood... in the book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't. And I, I won't. I don't want to. I don't want to spend time just reading out an article. But I. So, but I, they may have more of an argument in in the paragraph about it. But I will oh, say, yeah. actually, on that though, I think that's an op- There was a real opportunity there to chuck in an Easter egg for the next. Like Half Blood Prince must have been out at this point. Why is Regulus's name not on that family tree? <laughs> Well, so Half Blood Prince was out at that point, but Deathly Hallows was not. Ah, okay. Deathly right. Hallows is makes the sense. is the story that mentions Regulus properly. He's okay, referenced that makes in, sense then in the earlier books, but the the reveal of the locket and that whole situation doesn't come up until the final book, which came out apparently one week either after or before this movie. Oh, okay, okay, cool. Um, Umbridge doesn't come back to Hogwarts from the Forbidden Forest. Again, I think it makes sense for the movie. And then Battle of Department of I... Mysteries we've talked about. And I, I do think that's cleaner here. Not necessarily better, but it's definitely, as we've already discussed, they do some great editing with that battle, I think. Mm-hmm. What were you, you going to say? Well, I was just going to say about the, the Umbridge of, of, of it. Like, do we, yeah, I, I think so. For those who don't re- recall or haven't read, in the book, Umbridge's ending is she's in the hospital wing clearly traumatized by having been hurt, tortured, tormented, whatever, by the centaurs. I've seen the dumb theories that the centaurs, like, raped her and stuff, and I just think, like, come on. like Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've, uh, I've, there's, literally, there was a big thing a couple of years ago, uh, I say a couple of years ago, probably like five years ago, where, like, one person put out, like, a, like a, either a tweet or a blog post or something theorizing about that, and it, like, was... People really got into that idea, like... And we're like, oh, there's hints of it, and that uh, there, there really isn't. It's 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 a kid's book. Uh, JK's mind doesn't work like that. That's really too far. No, it just doesn't fit the world. Doesn't fit anything. Doesn't even fit the centaurs. I don't. No, 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 no. Nil pois. No. Whoever came up with that thought, spread it around. It's wrong. Um, but but either way, right? The 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 idea is she's had 
she suffered at the hands of the centaurs, right? And she's all dead eyed and the, the and, and Mad, Madame Pomfrey. It's a really funny. The reason I'm sad it's gone, I guess, is just because I like the joke. So maybe it's just one of those things of like, yeah, it's probably better for the movie not to have it. But they're in the hospital wing after all of the events of this movie, seeing Ron, I think, who got injured during the battle at the ministry. And uh, <laughs> Madame Pomfrey says, yeah, she's not said a word for days. And she leaves. And Ron goes, yeah, but she does react when you do this. And he makes a soft clip clopping noise with his mouth. And she sits bolt upright. <laughs> <laughs> which is, that is which funny. Is, and then he stops and she just slowly lies back down and goes back to I being think, catatonic I think some we get because so the pro, basically her her ending in here that's a great scene her ending in here is the prophet headline about her going away from Hogwarts and it's weird because I think we've spent enough time with her to justify maybe more of a scene and more of an ending kind of like with the Cho plot but I think the, the 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 counter to that is they concentrated on the right things. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't want that at the expense of the Harry stuff. Um, yes. I mean, I'd have taken maybe a slightly longer edit of the movie with those two scenes in. Um, but I think there is... Well, that's, there that's the thing. This is, like the, this is the shortest one. So I think they had time to add a couple of things. And I'll talk about it then because yeah. there's two changes I would make to this movie. And we'll talk about those at the end. Well, the, um, yeah, and I'm nearly done with this list. So, Sirius Black, Sirius Black's last words. I thought he called him James in the book, doesn't he? That is, that can't be a film exclusive. It's not in that moment, I don't think. But I could have sworn he called him James. Uh, in the yeah, book. so in in the in the book, his 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 last words is some sort of taunt at Bella. Um, he does. Yeah, and I think this he, is. Better. I think there is a point when he accidentally calls him James in the book, but it's much, much, much earlier in the book. Um, and, I, and I think the notion of him saying last, it. Putting it there in his last moment is a really powerful choice, in my opinion. Yeah, I think, yeah. I, I would agree that that's a, not necessarily an improvement, but a a powerful thing the book didn't do. I think that's a really clever choice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the final two were No Spew and Stouting Harry in the Park. I don't remember Christ, Spew, Spew being in the book. Yeah, because but... also Spew starts in the previous book because Winky being mistreated by Crouch... Yeah, and then Spew kicks off in full gear here when she finds out that ha- Crouch, having uh, re- released Winky in the previous book, they find out that Dobby and Winky both work in the Hogwarts kitchens. No, that's Goblet. That's in Goblet. So I don't see. I don't remember there being no. Much Spew are are in you the sure book? that's in? Oh yeah. You know what? You're yeah. right because that's why Dobby is around to. Yeah. Um, uh, to to give Harry the gillyweed, you're right. You're well, exactly and Winky right. to get and Winky to get questioned at the end. Um, yes. So yeah, I don't remember there being much spew in the book, but I kind of think you can't blame the book for continuing a storyline uh, that's you know in the previous one, yeah. and actually yeah. it prompts something. It maybe Rowling already knew that spew was going to be the thing that essentially prompts the kiss in Deathly Hallows. So what what would you what would you change? So well, I got. I, I'll give some uh, context just for just to for just you know first to set it, set this up. I think one of the most important things this movie does, uh, sorry, this book does, is the, the prophecy stuff. Um, and I think it's really important that conversation that Dumbledore and Harry has for two reasons. It was huge in the book, by the way. It's a massive, massive chapter. It's just a conversation between two people that goes on for pages and pages and pages. And I know you obviously can't adapt that into the film. I understand that. But the conversation they do have is about two lines, maybe four, and then it moves on. It's ridiculous. So the the reason, uh, the, the things that I would change, one is we've already covered, actually, it's Umbridge, clarifying Umbridge and her involvement with the Dementors. The second change would be Harry and Dumbledore's conversation. It needs to be longer for two reasons. One is the prophecy stuff. I think it's really important. I think a, I think a person watching this movie could get to the end and not really understand what the stakes were. Mm. Because the movie sets up, Voldemort's after something. What, like a weapon, says, suggests Harry? The reveal being no information, essentially, the prophecy. Um, maybe an understanding of how what his and Harry's relationship truly is that will allow him to defeat Harry. Unclear. Through not telling Harry the truth, 
that leads to Harry making the choices he makes in this movie. Letting Harry believe that this is all about a weapon. Mm. It's very important that we understand that, I think. I don't need the backstory of Sybil Trelawney giving the prophecy, Snape overhearing it, taking it to Voldemort. I don't need any of that. We can find that out in the next one. That's fine. That doesn't need to be in this movie. Nope. But what we do need is an understanding of what the stakes of this film were. And what we also need, desperately, is for Harry to be feeling responsible. Because in the book, push his glasses up nose, Harry isn't just doesn't just go, oh, um, I fucked up, I've brought us here, and, and it turns out it's a trick, and then never mention it again. When Sirius dies, Harry blames himself. Now, they may tackle that in the next movie a little bit. Who knows? But in the, in the book, he's raging in Dumbledore's office. At himself, at Dumbledore, at everyone. And I don't need him to be angry if you want to make that choice for the character here. But the sentiment that comes out of that conversation is both an understanding of the importance of the prophecy and an understanding of where Harry is at now as a character whose who, who's heroics just led to him getting his the closest thing he has to a father figure killed and then having Dumbledore say actually this is my fault Mm. it's so important for both of those characters and their relationship Dumbledore saying I was the one who kept you in the dark this year this whole thing could have been prevented if I'd have just had the foresight or the, the, the intelligence to say to you Harry this is what's going on but I kept you in the dark and I made the mistake and I got Harry a serious kill. This is brilliant line when Harry is smashing up the things in Dumbledore's office and Dumbledore says something along the lines I'm paraphrasing because I don't have the quote in front of me. Um, I know you're angry and you're smashing up all the objects in my office but I would like to have thoroughly earned it. You, I'm not, you're not as angry as me as even you should be and I would like to have thoroughly earned it. So then he sits Harry down and has the conversation. And that conversation is one of Dumbledore's feelings for Harry getting in the way of him being honest with Harry, which plays a huge part in that character's role going forward too. And I'm not saying all of this needs to be in this movie, but some of it does. (laughs) And much, much stronger than the, well, I thought if I kept away, he wouldn't realise about the connection, which is what the movie does, which isn't as uh, character-driven from Dumbledore's point of view. Um as it could be. Yeah, no, I completely And, agree and when with you've that. done such a good job paring the movie down so that it is actually the shortest of all the Harry Potter movies, you know what? Fuck it. A fi- a five minute scene. Sounds like a long time to be in one scene, but it's an important scene. Yeah, because all the pieces of that are in this movie. Like you yes. don't need to <laughs> add anything else to make no. that a, make no. that a thing. Like no, it's all you- there. Just need to have them have that conversation. And it would tie this movie up in a beautiful little bow. It would add a few minutes to the time. I get that. But you know what? You've saved so much cutting all the other stuff that I agree you can go that I cannot for the life of me fathom. So yeah, if I had the ability to change two things in this movie, which is, which is what I would do, and it would be basically close to perfect if you did the Ombridge's reveal and that scene needs to happen. Would you, Dan, though, speaking of Dumbledore, because anyone would watches you it, say... I, I, I ask you this, Chris, sorry, if we change somebody, actually, honest question for you. Do you think a person watching this movie finishes it and has any idea what the fuck a prophecy is or how it works or why it's there or what the point of any of this was? No to the wider things, but they understand because it's like literally spelled out. They understand that what only, only Harry can kill Voldemort and that one of them is going to kill the other one. But... But why was Voldemort after that? that? Yeah, no, no, no. I, yeah, no, I agree with that. The nuances of it are lost. But I think the the most important thing for them to understand, they understand. Um, mm. But yes, the why the why Voldemort was after it is probably the biggest thing that is is not is not there. <laughs> yeah, and I could see, I could Especially... imagine somebody coming out of the movie thinking that Sirius was the one who told Harry Voldemort was out after a weapon. The actual exchange is he's after something, something he didn't have last time, and Harry suggests like a weapon. Mm. But it wouldn't, you know, in the, you know, in the throes of watching and taking in a movie, it would be very easy to come away thinking, didn't Sirius say it was a weapon right up front? Mm. How was that a weapon? Like I just, 
yeah, it, it, there's a million ways that could be broken and, and, and could not work for people. And I think that's such a shame because it's, it's, this movie's so close to being really extraordinarily good. And it just those two things really, really let it down. There's one other tinier thing that we'll talk about later, but um, those are my two big ones. Well, well, uh, what were you going to say something well, about Dumbledore? Yeah, while we're on Dumbledore, potentially controversial statement to say to you, um, whilst still not perfect, I think this is probably Gambon's best performance so far. Why aren't you studying? Yeah, that bit I didn't like at all, but there is also stuff that he's brilliant. <laughs> he's, he's Shouldn't brilliant you be learning something, you little shits? I'm calm um, Dumbledore. Well, the, the, yes, but the mo- him in the ministry, like defending yep. Harry, great, great performance. Actually, mm. whilst the scene needs to do more, he's great in that last scene with Harry as well. Um, so I think there are just... Uh, mm. I think this is his best so far. Let me just check something just very quickly. Which movie does Dumbledore appear in the least? Oh, the one where he avoids Harry the entire movie. Let's see. <laughs> Which one did Michael Gambon annoy me the least in? The one he appears the least in. Oh. Yeah, I'm not saying. I'm not saying that's not <laughs> I, why. I don't think but... this is. He gives a good performance. I think this is. He's barely in the movie. <laughs> do you not therefore... think those two examples were? Good? Do you not think him at the trial is good? Him. Look, here's the thing. And an average. On an av- in an average Harry Potter movie, Michael Gambon is passable in, I don't know, let's say five out of ten scenes, and egregiously bad in five out of ten scenes. If he's only in four scenes in the movie, sure, two or three of them might be good. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I just, I, I, I honestly, it's, it's when he's bad, he's so egregiously bad that it doesn't make up for passable in shorter scenes. When he's right, not okay, given a lot to do, uh, 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 you know, I got... he he delivers he... one of my favourite Dumbledore lines from the books in this, and butchers it, and then which is you know, which is what oh uh, which is um I believe you're you're under the impression I'm going to come along quietly, <laughs> you know. Um, oh, it's a great, oh, it's a great moment. It's such a it's such a good line, and I I don't like his delivery on it at all. Um, and then on top of that, for me. You know, you, I can't get over the snapping at the children thing. That's honestly, snapping at the children is yeah. worse than did you put your name in the goblet, Harry? By miles. Well, especially especially because it's it, it, because actually the the whole you've got the right to expel my teachers, but not not demolish them from the ground. That's that delivery is great. Yeah, so, but because, it's just yeah. ruined. That's, it's yeah, that's one of his better ones. By the yelling. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. It's 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 it's, it's embarrassing. Undercut. And here, here's the other thing. I've been thinking about this because I keep beating myself up and going, "Ah, oh, it's not fair. It's it's just a different interpretation of the character. I can't keep going. It's not as good as the version of the book." And I'm going, "No, actually, I think I can because the version of the character that's in the book serves the story better. Mm. So it's not just oh, it's a different interpretation. Accept it for what it is. This version of Dumbledore is a cranky old git." that snaps at children and shakes Harry to the village of his life. <laughs> um, it, it's not, you know, shoves him up against a wall like he's about to fucking stab him. <laughs> you know, the, you know that, that's just a different... He's just an angrier Dumbledore. He's a less calm Dumbledore. Okay, fine. We've got a slightly less arrogant Harry where you can have an angrier Dumbledore. Okay, but the problem is that actually has an impact on the story because Dumbledore's choices guide Harry. And his love for Harry is his weakness. Harry, as he says in this book, the, the book this one is based on, was his weakness. He cared for Harry and he he really needed to be able to separate himself from Harry. His love yeah, and his what, affection for those characters is what makes him make some of the choices he makes. Yeah, which is why he didn't, because he talks about how that's why he didn't answer him, what, how he's tried to tell him about the prophecy, like, almost every year, but hasn't. Right. Um, I've and, got two and, other... And, 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 you know, and then when he's there yelling at them all and being grumpy with them all, I'm just like, ah, it doesn't work. Sorry. Yeah, no. Also, it's not that... This movie tries to pretend like him just walking off and, you know, shoving off Harry, like, oh, I don't want to talk to you. I'm going to run away. There was some sort of shocking development. I'm like, I don't know. The guy seemed pretty pissy with you last year. It doesn't seem that out of fucking character. <laughs> yeah, that's true. 
Um, I've got, I got two other big compliments and then a, a, crit- a critique to discuss, but which we will naturally, mm-hmm. I think, discuss in the questions, which is the, the ministry fight. Uh, but we can incorporate that in the questions. Yes. So my two other big compliments before hearing your other minor change. Uh, Gary Oldman is brilliant in this movie. He's absolutely yes. fantastic. Um, he's so good. The, the, the subtle nuances, the way he looks at Harry, the chemistry mm-hmm. between the two of them is in general brilliant. But Gary Oldman in particular is just phenomenal uh as is fred and george's exit and their whole uh, you know it's time to leave hogwarts thing although i do question i don't know if it is in the book a big dragon but obviously the we we kind of have a similar visual twice in the film and maybe i'd have mixed it up a bit we have a big dragon of what of you know fireworks and then later we have a big dragon of fire heading towards a character. It's sort of, and I don't like the parallel imagery between something Fred and George do, does and then something Voldemort does later. I think I would have chosen maybe something else for Fred and George. Um, but I, uh, but their whole exit is brilliant. And the, the Nigel scene with them and the build up to them. So the fact that, again, this film goes right. If we're going to do Fred and George exiting, Let's build to it. Whereas it feels like other films in the past have gone, oh, well, we need that moment. And then not bothered about building up to that moment. Um, the, the Fred and George exit, I thought was great. Yeah, I, I, I was a big fan of it too. I did have one sort of, uh, this is more of a like quibble than it is. This is a, this is a proper in the book. Um, there's a really reasonable amount of emphasis in the book put on Fred and George not wanting to disturb exams. They, it's it's a weirdly interesting character moment for them because they're obviously the, you know they're, they're they're sort of the mischief makers at Hogwarts. That's always been their role, and they have this kind of they haven't had a chance to do as much of that in the movies in general actually. But sure, that's you know they're kind they're kind of presented as that. Um, but there's a point in the book when Hermione's like, you know, you guys haven't like messed up any of Umbridge's lessons or caused any problems in a little while. What are you doing? And they're like, well, you know, everyone's studying for their exams and. We're not gonna, mm. we're not gonna, we're not gonna upset that. You know, you've all got your futures to think about, and it's like a really nice moment. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> like that's actually very considerate of you. So the fact in the film it deliberately takes place mid-exam, mid-exam, feels slightly shitty. Like, I look, I, I get it. It's the optimum disruption to Umbridge and her regime, but there's people trying to. Put you know, kid, the, 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 those kids didn't do nothing to you guys. You don't want you know. Let's not upset their exam. They they've worked hard to study all year. They want to get good jobs. They want good grades. Some of them. I don't know. It's part of me that kind of went. That's pretty shitty. Yeah, that's fair. I'll t- I'll, t- I'll take it for the. It's a is it, look. It's a quibble. I like the visual of it. There's the desks everywhere. Yeah, like the, the signs. The signs yeah. coming down and all right. that stuff is just yeah. brilliant. It's, like. it's so, look, it's handled beautifully. But here's the thing: why couldn't it have just been breakfast? <laughs> They'd still be in the great hall. They could still do all that stuff. I guess then they're not disturbing like a lesson. I don't know. Oh, uh, maybe an assembly, an assembly of Umbridge. She's giving some sort of talk, making them right. All listen. Perfect. There you go. Great. Yeah. I, that, just a simple change like that. And I know it seems, and, and I'm admitting this one is a quibble. I'm admitting it's mm. a quibble. And I'm admitting it's based in, it is based in book knowledge. But I think it would be fair for someone to watch this movie and go, huh, it's a bit rude of them to, you know, these people want good grades, <laughs> don't disrupt their exams. Mm. You know, that's a shitty thing to do. Like pulling a fire alarm during an exam is a shitty thing to do. I'm sorry, it just is. <laughs> like, you know, mm. uh, you wouldn't do it. So uh, I think that's, I, 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 yeah, it, it, it's, it doesn't, doesn't endear me to the movie versions of those characters, regardless of the line in the book. Um, yeah. But it just so happens in this case, the line in the book directly contradicts that. So yeah, strange, strange choice. But I get it. The visual is great. The, 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 it's wonderful. Uh, that, them, you know, sm- smashing all of the, 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 the her, you know, uh, what do you call it? Her decrees down is just a glorious moment. After we're watching that, that build and build and build all movie, to the point where it's so ridiculous that it's like they put a new one up. It's like, who's reading that? It's like, it's, it's like 10 meters in the air. Like, they're not allowed brooms in the Great Hall, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> who's, who can even read that? <laughs> like, it's so, uh, it's, like I say, it's so it's fun so... and so ridiculous as a visual. Yeah. 
like I said earlier, just I, my heart was so warm for David Bradley in all those scenes. Um, so good. What was He's your so good what was this. your other what was your other minor change? Um, the minor one, the, the one that's not like a, a just it's not a big thing. It's just a, it's, if they create a problem for themselves in a later movie, and it's so funny actually because um, so those of you, who, if you who didn't live through these movies and kind of came to them later on because you may be a little younger, um, won't remember the the buzz around this story getting out. But it became apparent prior to the final book's release that J.K. had told them they needed to include creature that he wasn't a part of the original script. And that he had to be there to stop themselves causing problems for the final book. And of course, final book not being out yet, speculation grew from that. Why is Creature important? That's very interesting. Why would she specifically say that? Everyone gets all excited. Now, it turns out the reason is because obviously Creature becomes a little bit fairly relevant to the Regulus Black story. And that's fine. Understood. Except, there's nothing to say. You couldn't just go, the Blacks had a house elf in the final movie. There's, you don't need to establish Creature here. He's no longer in, he's not in part of the plot of this movie. So instead, he just becomes this weird hanger on. But isn't it funny, Chris, that in a world where JK went to very great efforts and, and it became public knowledge to get Creature in this movie to protect something from the final book? That she didn't do the same with the mirror, because and I, and I, and this is more of a criticism of a later movie, so maybe it doesn't go here. But this would have been the solution. Um, in a later movie, Harry has a fragment of mirror that is linked to a fragment of mirror at Aberforth's house, with, as far as I remember, no explanation whatsoever. Zero. You just go. Yeah. He's got that. I guess it's magic mirror. Sort of. It's a deeply confusing moment to my memory. And we'll find out. We get there. Maybe we'll get there and there is an explanation. Maybe there's a line, a throwaway line that I missed last time I saw it. Maybe this will all be for naught. But in a world where you could have explained a lack of creature and just had creature be explained in the seventh movie. Eighth movie, I suppose. No, no, seventh. Seventh. Um, I find it weird she didn't also suggest they set up the mirror. So for those who don't remember... Yeah, that's- The tragedy of this story is that actually Harry could have found out very quickly that Sirius was absolutely fine and he needed to run off to the... I don't know about you, but I spent the entire book yelling, reading the entire book, yelling internally, go to the mirror! (laughs) I don't think we know it's a mirror, but I I think if memory serves, he gets handed a package and Sirius says to him, this is how you can get in touch with me if you need me. And Harry makes a mental note that he's never going to use it because he's scared he's going to get serious in trouble or caught. And then he puts it at the bottom of his trunk and forgets about it. Then, later in the movie, he gets the full... You know, he has the dream. Voldemort is implanted in his brain that suggests Sirius is in trouble and off he rushes to the Ministry after being misled by a creature. But that's irrelevant uh, to this point. So that's what happens. And at the end, Harry, after Sirius dies, realises he had a perfect method of communicating with him the entire time, which is a two-way mirror that James and Sirius had used in their youth to talk to each other when they were in different classes. It's a very sweet thing. And it's also kind of tinged with tragedy. So we've got a two-way mirror. When you're talking to one end or look at the other end, it's like a video call. You can see the other person on the other side and you can talk to them. Harry eventually... This, this breaks in the bottom of Harry's trunk and he has a shard of glass and later in the uh, in the series it becomes relevant in a, in a, when they're trapped. When help is sent to rescue them, he uses that shard of mirror to acquire help. Doesn't matter from who yet. We'll talk about that later. That mirror just is in the, one of those movies with no explanation. And yeah, that's well, as, as far as I remember. Because I remember the mirror, the mirror is definitely in it. I can't remember if they give any context to it either. I would suspect not. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you know, we know who's writing it. So my, uh, so, so my, you know, my situation here is like as a minor quibble. I find it strange she went to the trouble to force them to put creature in. There's something that could be explained pretty easily, and not the mirror. <laughs> Am I wrong? Am no, I, think I that's wrong? Very fair. No, I think that's very fair because that feels way more important. Because another one for me is like. I'm pretty sure in the Chamber of Secrets, the you know the the diary is given to Lucius Malfoy, but Dumbledore just has it again in the in the Half Blood Prince movie, which we'll see if I'm my memory's right on that next week. But should we uh, should we do questions and then and then trip? 
Yeah, let's do some questions. I've probably got another few notes, but I'll, I'll we'll, we'll try to get through these as we get through the questions because I'm sure some of them are related to the notes anyway. Um, so the questions, if for those who don't know, we've been asking questions as we've gone on every week about these movies and whether they function um, that we've been asking of each one. So uh, the first question is, does the story work on its own? Um, the little sub bit is natural and logical sequence of events without need for extra context from the books. I would say that is mostly a big fat yes. I'd what say for the question? first time ever... It's yes to both of those. <laughs> yeah, yes. Because even when we would begrudgingly go, yeah, you'd follow it on your own without context, we still kind of tinged that even with a, uh, no context for a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. What do you, so you, how do you feel about that in general? Oh, you, you, the structure of the film, anything you want to add on that subject? No, yes to both for all the reasons we've talked about. I think mm. the use of... I'm just repeating myself here, but the the use of the script montages. writing and filmmaking techniques uh, to make that work through, in particular, you know, the dreams. Oh, because uh, that was one of the note I can slip in here. Actually, even the transitions between scenes I really noticed here were brilliant. Like, there's a point where Harry is having a bad dream, and it's about the hearing. And in his dream, he hears, you know, your hearing is tomorrow is on this date. And then the next scene is the hearing, and it it says everything about Harry's mental state. It says about the vivid dreams, and it lets the audience know we're now going to the hearing. Another really subtle one that's just really entertaining is Luna goes, Oh, I hope there's pudding about the feast. And as the next scene pans along the feast, we just see Luna take a bit of pudding and smile broadly. Like, just (laughs) all of the work they did to make that narrative function um, is great. And yeah, for the, I don't think we did that question maybe with the first two films, but. We, uh, yeah, certainly compared to Prisoner of Azkaban and Goblet, it's a big fat yes to both of those points. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think so. And I, and, and I think it does mostly come down to the... Uh, well, well, it's two things, isn't it? It's, it's, it's the choices to cut all the stuff we talked about at the beginning. But I do think, you know, we talked about them, but just to layer some more praise on, I think the montages in this are brilliant. They're, like, fun. They move at a clip. They show time passing. They really do a lot to demonstrate the damage Rumbridge's regime does to Hogwarts, and they're all sort of, as you said, sort of like punctuated with these these decrees going up, you know. And that's just very clever. And then the use of all—I mean, that's the other thing, right? So these these newspapers have looked like this since the first one, right? There's, it's the same graphic designers uh, design. It's a team, I think. I think I went to a museum of like um, exhibition that those guys did of their work on these movies. So it was all like the newspapers and lettering and, you know, they designed all the daily profit pages and the text uh, and the way the lettering was laid out. And also like, you know, the, the Harry wanted poster from the final movie, you know, undesirable number one, they designed all of that. And um, I, they did an exhibition. It actually, they actually put it on near the theater for cursed child. So I think I went and looked at that the day I also saw cursed child. Um, and it was, uh, it was really good. And they do a really a lot of good work. This movie I guess someone somewhere went, hey, you know those Daily Profit things we've kind of had glimpses of throughout this process? And everyone went, yeah. They're really good. (laughs) Maybe we just put a ton of focus on them. (laughs) Like, graphically, they're beautiful to look at, and we can pass on a ton of information to the audience. And someone went, oh, yeah. (laughs) And that's just what they do, and it's great. (laughs) It's really good. Such a powerful decision. Yeah. So good. Yeah, so big, 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 big yes for me on that question. Um, I think the next question is kind of a subsection of that as well. Can you see the seams of where things have been cut? I think in this case, no, because things have all been cut pretty nope. cleanly. Like Marietta Edgecombe mm. is just not in the movie, mm. and I think in a in a in a in a Cloves version of this script, Cho introduces Marietta Edgecombe. And kind of half mentions that her mum works at the ministry, and then later on they would forget to actually exp- use that as explanation as to why she rats them out. Yeah, completely. I think that would absolutely be the case. Um, and as we as we said earlier, the decision to shift it to Cho is uh, is great. And I think there's a lot of instances like that. You know, we don't, as we said earlier, we don't need other rooms in the ministry, so they're just not there. And you know, look, and uh, as we said before. It's an easier book to edit in that sense, I think, than The Goblet of Fire, which literally has like five sections you have to do. Yeah, I think so. Because I think, you know, all the stuff we've talked about them cutting, you know, the whilst slightly integral to one moment to the plot, 
Cho's friend is not as integral to the plot as Ludo Bagman is. Um, you know, and so I think these, if you look at the things cut, they are even in the book less integrally linked to the the story. You know, the main storyline and the, the main thrust, as the need to have to do the Yule Ball and have to do the three tasks. You know, you can cut you can cut Quidditch out because Quidditch is a great Ron plot, but it's a great Ron plot. You know, you can't you can't cut one of the tasks. Yeah, but when we talked about Goblet, we talked about cut Rita, cut, you know, cut... There was a few things we suggested they could cut when we talked about it yesterday. I'm trying to remember my brack in my brain. We only recorded that one yesterday, yeah. and I'll be honest with you, I cannot wait to stop thinking about Harry Potter for a day. Because I watched I watched Which... the movie, recorded a podcast the next day, then immediately watched the next movie, and now we're recording this the next day, and I'm just, I'm so exhausted with Harry Potter right now. <laughs> maybe, we, maybe we get a couple of days off between this and the next one, thankfully. I think that's a good thing. Right. Um, R- but there were tons Ron of things Harry's we talked fight. about in the last movie that we said that they could probably cut. Like, Ron, yeah, Ron and yeah, Harry's Ron fight and... didn't need to be there. Uh, they just chose not to. They just chose to leave them in, in their half-existent forms. Obviously, yeah, I just, you can't I just, cut the tasks I... the same way that you couldn't cut Umbridge, you know, from this. But that doesn't mean there's not other some more supplemental stuff that they couldn't have cut around that 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 that, that hurts the movie rather than helps it. I I I, st- I think there's plenty of things they could have cut from Goblet and chose not to. Yeah, no, I'm I'm not I'm not saying there's not there's not plenty of things they couldn't have cut. I I just feel that structurally this is an easier th- book to cut down than a book that literally has five distinct distinct sections. Um, mm. you know, even in this some of the stuff they kept in, they could have cut Fred and George if they wanted to. There's not too many things you need to keep in to keep that plot of Harry's in, well, in this case, they chose to focus on the character, but the actual narrative of what happens, um, I don't think there's too many things you, there's as many things you need to keep in as there are for Goblet. So it's not about could have cut more. It's about need to keep in maybe more so. Interesting. Interesting. I'm not a hundred percent sure I agree with that, but I, I understand this, the sentiment. Yeah. I can't form a, a strong enough argument against, but yeah, I, I think yeah. Uh, it's what's the next question? Is there enough school in this wizard school movie? Um, Christ, I was convinced this one would have tons of school, but there's barely any school. Did they do a single lesson in this movie? Well, the first uh, one. Well, there's there's uh, uh, oh, other than the Umbridge, no, there's no. There's one Umbridge one. I've just, I've just all movies. I've just realised. I've just realised there's barely any Snape. Well, I suppose there's barely any teachers because there's barely any lessons. There's, and there's barely any McGonagall. Yeah, there's barely any McGonagall. There's barely any Flitwick. There's barely any any teachers apart from Umbridge. And you could make an argument for Hagrid. Obviously, there's that great Trelawney McGonagall scene where she gets fired. You know, but, but the but characters Hagrid doesn't. Hagrid doesn't teach in this, which is a shame because he. That's the no. Whole... I just mean he's a, he's a, he's a teacher that is technically in it. You know. I mean, I, I'm not saying he's teaching. I'm saying there's barely any. That was me coming after me saying there's barely any teachers. Mm-hmm. Um, and and obviously you could make the same argument that you know there's Dumbledore who's arguably a teacher. Um, so no, there's I can't I can't. Whilst it feels inherently very set within the school because all the Umbridge stuff happens within the school, is there a lot of school? No, not really. <laughs> No, that's weird because it feels like I mean th- that choice of having in the book of having Hagrid introduce Thestrals in a magical care magical creatures lesson, they could they they could have done that. I mean, I like that Harry gets these one on ones with Luna, which don't really exist in the book. But, but I, su- I suppose I to be fair, the, the the teaching in this movie is the DA, isn't it? And actually, we, and uh, and yes. the and and the and the Ocklemon, whatever it's called, the Ocklemon Snape is. seeing into Harry's mind. So I suppose we get some Snape there. But the the actual that's the school in this this movie. It's not the traditional lessons of you know charms or transfiguration or whatever. It's Snape. Yeah. It's Snape and Harry and the Ocklemancy stuff I- and the DA stuff. I guess that makes sense. It's a shame because I think there's a in the book there's a huge number of stuff about their exams and the pressure of that that really gives this book a lot of texture. But I understand why you mm. can't have that in the movie. Mm. We've not it's... talked about the um, we've not talked about the Snape uh, stuff because you I felt like you had a point about the flashback. Oh Harry yes, yes, Snape's yes. Is, uh, yeah, I, it's very interesting they chose to show Harry's 
dad bullying Snape without showing that Snape just called someone a mudblood. Mm. Because I'm not certain, but I am pretty sure in that memory we see Snape call Lily a mudblood in the Order of the Phoenix version of it. And then we get more context for that later. But it's, it's oh, yeah, there. I can't remember. Um, I should check that in case this point is nonsense and they'll, cl- they'll, they'll cover it later. But yeah, it's weird to show James being a bully without showing why. Not yeah, I'm that whole thing to be... You, no, you're not wrong. And I, But that, that whole thing to me stinks of another kind of rowling. Oh, you should probably include this because it'll probably... It's it's kind of relevant later. That, I, that did, sort en- of I did enjoy... Them. It, I, I, I did enjoy them cutting out the pensive to do it. Yeah, I and need, I enjoy. I don't uh, need the pensive. <laughs> I don't think it is the pensive in order. It's the Harry does. It's what it is in the movie, isn't it? Harry does the spell, or, no. or Harry goes into his mind when it's open. It's the Mm-mm. pensive in later. No, it's the it's the pensive in this one. So what happens is um, Snape, whenever he's doing occupancy with Harry, separates certain memories with a wand and puts them in the pensive uh. every time before he starts. And then there's a there's a there's a lesson with Harry. When when uh, Draco bursts in and says, "You know, uh, Snape, they found uh, Montague, or whatever he's called. You know, the guy that was in the vanishing cabinet that was ah, lost yes. in there for several months that they find, which sets up the plot for Half Blood Prince. Um, uh, you know, and Snape's like, wait there, Potter, and off he goes. And oh, Malfoy right, looks okay. when he first comes in at between Harry and Snape, and he's like, what's this? And Snape's like, Harry's doing remedial potions, and <laughs> Draco's like, remedial potions? Anyway, then he gets Snape and they leave, and then Harry sticks his head in the pensive. And then when Snape yeah, gets back, sounds... he pulls him out. Um, the question is, though, uh, so I, yeah, I like that they changed that. I, I, you don't need any of that. That's it's, Look, it's fun. It's fun to have them make the excuse of remedial potions and get Malfoy's expression. But it's just fine that Harry like backfires the spell and gets into Snape's mind that way. But I'm trying to find the actual Yeah, set. Yeah, and I think that while you're looking for that, I think some of the again, some of the transitions it uses as part of that, like Harry, like the mirror coming back and you being mm-hmm. like, What the fuck is this? Like, but it's, it's it reiterates, you know, how he doesn't have his parents, and then we have Snape say, feeling sentimental Potter, that's a really nice moment. So I think they're probably in a world, it's uh, my answer to this question has sort of been similar each movie, each. But in a world where the is there is there enough school? No, but in a world where the DA uh, w- w- and those sequences are brilliant, Harry t- slowly getting into the groove of teaching others, them working as a group. You seeing the use of magic in those scenes, the use of spells, the Patronus stuff. Uh, you know, Luna's being a rabbit that hops around and then the Patronus is all disappearing as they are discovered and found. You know, those scenes are brilliant as well. And I think in a world where you have DA and you have the Snape stuff, whilst there is not that much school, there's probably the right amount of school because I think those things follow Ooh. that, form that function. Yeah, that's fair. And, I, and, and looking at this in terms of the memory as well, um, actually... It, he, we do have the mud blood moment, but it's Harry. Uh, sorry, Harry James. Um, he's already giving Snape a hard time and bullying Snape when Lily comes over and says, "Leave him alone," you know, back off. And then Snape's like, "I don't need help from filthy little mud bloods or whatever." I've got the line in front of me. Actually. I don't need help from filthy. Oh no, it's literally don't need help from filthy little mud bloods like her. I got it exactly right. Um, and then she's like, "Oh, fine, I won't help you in future." Then and then she sort of walks away. Um, so. Like, you know what, it's fine then, because they're sort of like, that wasn't the motivation for James torturing Snape it's, anyway. That's a thing that happens after, it's, so it doesn't matter. It's fine, but it's fine, but do we need it? Because it doesn't, they don't really make a thing of, I mean, I think there's a reference to it the scene after, but it doesn't become the big, was, you know, was was my dad a bully thing that it becomes in the book and also it doesn't also become it almost contradicts if this film is about the rage that harry feels in him and whether that's voldemort having a scene which goes no it might be your dad it like you know what i mean i'm not sure yeah i don't know if that that scene is needed yeah yeah also i mean do we need occlumency like I, i think that like i say it just smacks of 
oh, it's only there because it becomes slightly, you know, the link between them is very important. And I don't, I don't know if that's justification when we've got the dreams to represent that. And the dreams are done brilliantly, I think. Yeah, well, should we talk about the dreams? Because there's a motif, they're pretty good. They give you a good insight into how Harry's feeling without having him verbalize it they're a very creative visually um and they're a step out of what this these movies have traditionally done um visual of voldemort in a suit's pretty weird though isn't it <laughs> would, you, would you would you do you have any thoughts on voldemort in a suit chris <laughs> yeah that felt that felt a little bit like there's no i don't think there's uh, maybe i'm gonna be proven wrong but i don't think there's as much voldemort in these movies as as memory makes you think there is <laughs> like and that just feels like Oh, let's get some more Voldemort in. Whack him in a suit and put him in King's Cross. Fuck it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so uh, it was in my trivia, but I'll do it now because we're on the subject. It's also very interesting to realise that some of the people who worked on this movie were under the impression Voldemort really was there in a suit. Um, so, me- yeah. Uh, many fans were critical of the scene where Harry sees Voldemort in the train station dressed in a muggle suit, saying it was out of character for Voldemort to do such a thing, both be out in public and wear a suit. Director David Yates and producer David Heyman defended the scene, although each have different takes on it. Yake explained that it was Voldemort's... Oh my god, it's Yates. Oh, it's the wrong way around. Oh my god. Yates explained... Oh, this explains so fucking much. Alright. Yates is going to be getting it in the neck a lot these next few movies, so we'll, we'll, we'll... I'm going to try and go easy here, but Yates explained that it was Voldemort's way of taunting Harry. He could appear in plain sight in a crowd of muggles and no one would realise how dangerous he is. So he really, in Yates' mind... Voldemort really did appear on platform land in three quarters in front of everyone. Which is weird, considering Yates also then directed and put in the scene after that where Harry wakes up. <laughs> no, but he doesn't he have a flash of it first when he's actually on platform land in three quarters and then later on it's part of his dreams. Yeah, but then the whole thing, the whole him being any moment beyond serious, like so many shows and movies have done it where the logic there is just any moment beyond him leaving Sirius is part of the dream. Like, nothing else happens in that moment. It's just no, him walking through no, no, the what crowd. I'm, what I'm saying is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Harry is on the platform, has that moment, and looks around, Voldemort's gone, I think. And then, later on, that image becomes a recurring image in his dreams. Am I wrong? Uh, so I've got the moment here. It's, it's all in where the Voldemort disappears. Uh, hold on. No, Voldemort never disappears. Voldemort looks at him and then Harry wakes up. He's asleep against the Oh, window. right. Well, in that case, that's fucking insane. Um, fair enough. I was try- I need- Look, David, look, Mr. Yates, um, not a huge fan, but, you know, I'm sure you, you're I'm sure you very good at something. Um <laughs> We haven't really talked about his direction at this movie. We'll come back to that, I guess. Um, look, it, it, buddy, uh, it, you, you put it in your movie that it was a dream. I tried to defend you. There isn't a defense to be had. You're a fucking idiot. Right. Uh, whereas Heyman, the producer, on the other hand, felt that it would have been a figment of Harry's imagination symbolizing Voldemort um, playing on Harry's mind. Fine. Yeah. Perfect. It's like yeah. the whole see- the whole movie is full of fucking dreams where Voldemort appears. <laughs> like- <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. Carry yeah. On. So next um, question. <laughs> uh, next and final question: How is magic portrayed? Oh dear. Uh, Here we go, baby. There we go. Okay. All right, so time, time to time to, time to get out my uh, David Yates pinata and start giving it a good old smack around the head. <laughs> okay. So the the Ministry fight between Dumbledore and Voldemort isn't as gre- as egregious as it was in my memory. There is some degree. Of spells doing yeah, cool that's shit. That's fine. However, <laughs> the yep. the beginning of it is why they need to why we need to see their wands touch in the middle and both. Ah, oh, it's a symbol of strength. Oh, bollocks. It's, it's a just, beam it's duel. A... Who doesn't love a beam duel? Have you never seen an anime, Chris? <sighs> we've seen two, two we've colorful seen, beams seen, pointing we... at each other. You've you've in the last movie there was a reason for a beam duel. This is just ah uh, anyway. So there's beam duel of it all, and and yeah. the fight between the the um, Dumbledore's um, army and the Death Eaters. By the way, side note: the Death Eaters have a much better look in this film than they did in the Goblet of Fire. Um, yeah. They look Agreed. they do look much more menacing, it, much better. Good work yeah, there, when guys. They, when Good work in the, when they're in the CGI PS2 Hall of Prophecies. 
um, you know, with all the the green screen. (laughs) When they're down the corridors, each of them, you know, just sort of like menacingly staring as they talk to Lucius, they felt very threatening. (laughs) Like I, mm, I was like and, I was and, way more threatened by their presence than Bellatrix's. <laughs> Put it that yeah, way. Yeah, and actually we've not we we've not really like that whole sequence. The fact that the the da um, the da lean on each other. The Neville mm-hmm. Neville manages to um, stupefy someone. Um, mm-hmm. The fact that they work together as a team. Even the thank, cr- thank uh, not- Christ, someone remembered that stupefy exists. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and you know the way the. The way that Ginny produces that really powerful spell, showing because obviously in the books she's this great mm-hmm. wizard, great witch. Sorry, and they've not really got the time to do that in the films, but mm-hmm. do it here in a visual representation. Mwah, brilliant! The prophecies yes. falling, all of that stuff's great. But then fundamentally, which is relevant to the answer to the question, it turns into the Order of the Phoenix and the Death Eaters shooting sparks at each other, <laughs> and is the yes. beginning of wand guns, which Dan and I have been made very clear. We're not fans of one guns. <laughs> I wouldn't even say we're not fans of. I'd say fucking hate. <laughs> I despise <laughs> wand guns. It's everything a movie about magic shouldn't be. It's the bigger problem with the first uh, Doctor Strange movie where it all boils down to firecracker kung fu, lots of people kicking sparks at each other, and then you see Doctor Strange in Infinity War and he's doing fucking magic, you know, that thing he's known for. You know, with Thanos, where he's, like, making multiple versions of himself, tying Thanos up with weird threads, just doing all sorts of weird magic shit, because he's a magic user. Here, we've got the most imag- Like, the- all of the possibilities and the imagination just boils down to guns, fire guns, we fire guns, we shoot at each other, spark, spark, sparks, here are some sparks, here's a stupefy, here's a stupefy, here's a stupefy. Oh, look, someone just yelled their father cadavra. Like, come on, like... Which, which, by the way, in itself, the movies, the movies like fly, play fast and loose with far too often. Um, and like, doesn't it, at this point, like, yeah, Harry goes to try and perform the Crucius course on, on Bellatrix. That might be in the book. I can't remember. That is in the book. I know. Yeah. He, yeah, yeah. Um, but just it's yeah, and and you know what? In the book, One it's guns... Bellatrix that taunts him though and says, you know, you need to really uh, mean, to it, mean it, Potter. It. You know, yeah. instead of the Voldemort thing. Ooh. But go on. Wand guns for me, as much as the stuff in the DA and like I say, the scene where they're all producing Patronuses and stuff is very heartwarming and magical. Wand guns for me means that the answer to that question has to be no. And actually, there's also Correct. not as much. There's not as much background magic. There's not as much. Um, you know, the, I mean, you know, even the cats in the portrait. That's quite funny. Um, in Umbridge's office, but we've seen the portraits move already. You know, Filch mm-hmm. taking the, yeah. pe- the people out of the portraits. <laughs> That's what, but... That shot, I've got, I've got questions about that shot. What's happening in that shot? They're evicting the portrait contents? Why? They can just go Why? to another portrait. Yeah. Well, the portrait people are affected by the gravity of, of, of like, if the, if the portrait is turned upside down, they fall down? I don't, what is happening? What, and is, also, what is this? I, I don't... I like that because it's a fun idea, but I don't yeah. remember a sort of sweeping establishing shot of the castle being magical with the portraits. Like, mm. that's really dependent on your vision of Hogwarts in your head as to why that's such a bad thing, as opposed mm. to anything the movie shows. Like, I'm skimming through now, and there's not a great Hogwarts, it's magic, and there's all these portraits to then justify mm. and make more powerful Filch getting rid of them. Um, but yes, I will say magic is uh, not done as well. And in line with that, Dan, I was uh, my memory was correct last week when I said it's really weird that the Sirius' fire, face in the fire is done. The same thing is done completely differently but in like, the very next movie. But, but cheaply and horribly. So I said, yeah. I don't mind either of those effects depending on how they're applied, right? They could both potentially look good if handled well, right? I think there was something kind of weirdly tangible and odd and sort of very Harry Potter about him appearing in the, the, the coals, the embers like that. It just it because it was such an odd visual and it kind of fits with the sort of strange world of these movies. So I kind of like it. It's not how I envisioned it when I read the books, but like totally works. Really interesting. Not the like really boring other flames take the shape of his face. But this isn't even the flames take the shape of his face. This is like a crossfade. They just like they just got some footage of some flames and then like stuck a, a bad 
composite shot of of of, of fucking yeah. Gary Oldman over it, and it's awful. It's awful, Chris. So Why does it look so bad? I don't. You know what? I'm so. I can't believe I'm saying this. I don't even care. It's different. I just think it looks shit. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Because you could even actually, actually, you could fan explain it being different. Right. Which is if the flames are higher and the fire is roaring more. Yep. Then the face appears differently and higher, but the fact that it's just so poorly executed and just really bad it's, CGI. It's by far the worst I, visual effect in this movie. <laughs> I take it I take it you would agree that magic is not utilized well in the movie. Yeah, you literally it was so funny. I was listening to what you were saying and you were literally going through all my notes one by one. I was like, tick, 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 <laughs> tick, tick. And like that that isn't a criticism, that's an absolute compliment. You're exactly right. Yeah. Um I didn't care um for uh, the, the 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 way it devolved. I thought the Dumbledore Voldemort fight was pretty good. That's one of my favourite fights in the book, so it was nice to see that visualised. And I thought they did a pretty good job having them do different things. At first, it's a beam struggle, and you start to go, "Oh no, oh no!" But then it becomes, you know, the thing it should be, which is big. Voldemort throws a big giant snake at uh, Dumbledore. Dumbledore counters it with a big thing of water. You know, uh, Voldemort sends all this glass at Dumbledore. Dumbledore sort of shatters it and turns it into sand. Like it's great, yeah, cool. Well, give me, give me that. I'll take that any day. Oh, when he puts Voldemort in a big ball of water and spins him around like a fucking hamster in a, in a little ball thing, great. And what's so, so what's that's so great. good about that is what's so amazing about that is this subtle blocking of Harry that making Harry come out and look at it and be like, fucking hell. Yes. Like, you know, there's the blocking quick side note. Cause I've remembered another compliment that I didn't give some of the blocking in this film and the way again, it's used to support the growth in Harry's journey is brilliant. In particular, the Christmas at Grimnald place when all the Weasleys and I think Hermione are mm. at one end celebrating and happy and Harry comes in looking a bit glum and is completely separate from the rest of them. Yep. Even though they're all and there then, together. The, oh. And then joined by Sirius behind him in the yeah. doorway, also separate from the family. Because the whole point is Brilliant. Sirius's isolation is, is a big part of this story too. That is beautiful. Yeah. Very well done. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan. A couple of other examples that I wrote down that are, that are not as you know essential... Uh, I, I'm glad they finally remembered Stupefy exists, so when they want to knock people down with a spell now, they'd use that and not thingy. Um, but I also mentioned as well, I, in my notes, the, the one the one thing you didn't cover, which I'll, I'll throw in quickly here, um, Patronus, not really a big stag at the beginning of the movie. Minus one point. Mm. Mm. Just why isn't it a proper stag? Why isn't it a really clearly defined stag at this point? Harry knows how to do the spell now. Corporeal Patronus. It's a cool visual what the fuck? It's like a ball of white light that I think for a couple of frames might have legs and a staggish head, but it's very vague, and very undefined, and, a, and that's not good. It's a good. shame because Daniel Radcliffe and Harry look so badass when he when he moves his arm yes. and swoops it down to go to go save Dudley. Like it's such a cool hero shot, and if it was a full blown stag, mm-hmm. that just would have looked even cooler. Yeah, would agree. Yeah. Would uh, you got, agree? You got any other any other notes before we do the do the trip thing? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, who the fuck's Mrs. Fig? If you're a viewer of this, just who's Mrs. <laughs> who's Mrs. Fig? Like you, she, yeah, like like I, I I can't even imagine someone coming out of this going, was she in the, the Harry talks to her like he knows her? Was she, was she in the last movie? Did I miss this character? Yeah. Um, there's no attempt to explain who Mrs. Fig is, but Harry's like, you, you're you know Dumbledore, and it's I, like. Are we surprised? I, I, <laughs> I think I think she's name checked by in in another movie. She's name Maybe. checked, but you do not need just have Harry walk Dudley in, like just do it that way. Like you could do it all in the in the letter expelling him and the order arriving. Well, yeah, but then you like, then you miss the witness during the the trial. So my my solution. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah was to right. have him be like, "Who are you?" and her be like. Oh, I'm Mrs. Fig. I, 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 I've been, I've been asked to watch you from Dumbledore. Dumbledore's watching me. Like, just do that. They do well, have a little need, exchange. He, he like doesn't that. need to act like he knows her. That's all. That's the problem. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because they do have the exchange where she clarifies Dumbledore asked her to watch him. But yeah. Yes, they but, don't. It's, but instead of yeah. Harry saying like, "What are you doing here? How do you know Dumbledore?" Like he's surprised that Mrs. Fig has turned up. Just take away the surprise. <laughs> Of it being Mrs. Fig specifically, and have him act like he doesn't know her. 
That's okay. Yeah, yeah, you're we, right. He doesn't yeah. need to know her. That's fine. Um, Isn't it so, so yeah, funny, though, that that, like, because that's a real moment of this makes more sense if you know the book, and it just shows yeah. you how few moments of that there is in this film. Very few. Do you know what Very I mean? Few. Like, Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Agreed. Um, oh, also, wait, why is they, it... They just, is, Go on, sorry. Thank you. I was literally about to say, literally about to say, uh, is there a heat wave going on in the book? Because <laughs> I don't uh, remember no, that. No, there isn't. There is. There is. There's a, there's a thing about Harry listening to the news to hear signs of Voldemort doing things, and the you know there's right. it's not quite as severe as it gets in the next book when it's like there's a bridge being destroyed and a hurricane mm-hmm. and all this stuff which turn out to be giants and dementors and the signs of Voldemort's uprising happening, um, but you know Harry is listening to the news. They might oh yeah no you know there actually no there is a heat wave in the book because I remember the joke in the book is that Mrs Dursley is mad at the neighbours for cheating on the hose pipe ban more than she is. <laughs> right because because I so that's that is correct. But because I remember bigger... reading it in because it came but... out in summer because it was my school fate at the time and I stepped yeah. I was helping with the school fate and stepped away to buy the book I think it came out in June and I remember reading it being like it is hot <laughs> right 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 yeah but the funny thing about that is though I just it just says heat wave and then, you know it's heat wave in the news and you hear the presenter describe it as 35 degrees and I was just like wimps we did 40 in the yeah, UK know, this year right? <laughs> I know like especially bunch of we bloody watched it cowards on... We watched it on such a such a hot day, and like I was so jealous of um, Vernon's ice cream. I was like, "Oh man!" <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, D- 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 Dudley, he's he's a bad dude, but he doesn't need casual homophobia. I I, I don't need that in my movie. Thank you, two thousand seven. Yeah, the, yeah, the the, the dead mum stuff as well. I just thought it was he was a bit. That's too much. I don't know if that's in the book. I can't remember, but it just. Oh, I don't. I, I don't far. remember if it's in the if it's whether it's in the book or not. I it's it, it shouldn't be here, and it shouldn't be in the book either. There's no need for homophobia. I, I just I, no, thank you. The dead mum stuff too is a bit too far. I, no, 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 no. I, I get it. He's supposed to be villainous, but no, it's it's not right. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah. Um, one thing I liked, right, and this is something we need to talk about because we've talked about this a fuck of a lot in the other books, and it's amazing we've gotten to this point in this podcast without us talking about it. Let's talk about let's let's dip into our new favorite segment. It, does the trace exist in the magical world in the movies? Um, answer it seems mm. no. So we've been complaining multiple times that the rules are a bit fuzzy because they say he's not allowed to do magic at school. Yet we've had multiple instances of magic being done outside of school with zero consequence. My theory, without having recently seen the later movies, including this one was that the trace just doesn't exist. So you're not allowed to do magic, but they expect parents to enforce that on their kids because they obviously can't monitor the children outside of school. So you, as long as the magic doesn't become problematic to the point it alerts muggles, you get away with it. But flying a car to Hogwarts, you're getting caught. Blowing up your aunt and having her float across Little Whinging, probably getting caught. Right, big Patronus in front of essentially two Muggles, probably going to get caught. Right, Mm. is the kind of logic they're using in these movies, it seems. But I wasn't sure about how they were going to handle it here, because who would tell on Harry? Right, if there's no trace, Mm. if we're saying the trace isn't happening, which is why he didn't get in trouble for doing the Lumos spells, and Hermione didn't get in trouble for doing the Repero on his glasses, and he didn't get in trouble for Dobby's cake, I'm thinking, how the fuck are they going to work around that in this movie? Because the trace is a big part of the opening of this movie when Harry does his spell in front of the Dementors. The answer, it seems, is kind of simple and genius. The Ministry has, and I'm in quotes received intelligence that Harry has performed a Patronus charm. Not a trace, but intelligence. And if for a second you're going, well, how? Where? If Dolores Umbridge sent the Dementors, then I'm pretty sure she'd have put someone to fucking witness it so that when Harry defended himself, as she very well knew he would, she could get him for it. It's so good! If they put the Dolores yeah, Lumbridge thing good. at the end. 
But well, yeah, because it would it would fit into that really nicely, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I still really like that. I still I'm happy with the premise of the Ministry received intelligence because you could even if you're going with the Dumble uh, the sorry the Voldemort sent the Dementors logic because the movie doesn't give you the Umbridge answer. You could then say, well, the Ministry were monitoring Harry because they were waiting for him to fuck up because they were looking to discredit him. It, it fits. It's fine. It's it's just we, none of this stuff bothers me now because I think the movies have been actually weirdly consistent with it in a way that I was not expecting. So, cool. yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I'm what do we think of Tonks? To, I... We haven't talked about Tonks. Yeah, to- I mean Tonks. Tonks is played beautifully and and mm-hmm. you know and acted really well. Um, that she's not given enough to do, and I think it would have been really simple to have indications of her relationship with Lupin. Um, mm-hmm. You know, maybe when they get back, they hug or something like that. Um, but you know, Carrick acted brilliantly. Like, yeah, it's, it's, mm. it's good stuff. I feel like I wrote Voldemort in a suit is weird every single time he appeared because I've there's like that that appears like four times in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know why. Anyway, um, how did you feel about Grimald Place not being the Fidelius charm? Ah, uh, hold on, I've just been looking something up. Oh, okay, I can I can give you <laughs> my you- thoughts on that while you do that if you want. No, no, no! I've just discovered something. I might save it. Um, is it is it for a future episode? Well, just to let you know, everything you've just said is true. But if if I had a sneaking suspicion, and if this online translation of the script is correct, I am right in saying that the trace comes up and is named specifically in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part One. Which undoes it all. <laughs> hey guys, Dan here. I just died of irritation. Um, I won't be able to finish this podcast. I'm very sorry. These movies are fucking so, garbage. And I, anyone who likes I them thought is a fucking was, idiot. <laughs> I thought this was the case. And according to this transcript, it's Potter, you're underage, which means you've still got the trace on you. What's the trace? If you sneeze, the ministry will know who wipes your nose. We have to use those means to the, those means of transport. The trace can't detect. Ah, okay. Is, yeah. Wait a minute, though, because in that at that point, the ministry, the order, believe have been infiltrated by Voldemort. Yes, yeah, so could and have, yeah, and could in have the book, trace. in in the book, they say they're under the guise of protecting you are watching your every move but actually it's because they want to find out what you're up to because they're passing the information to Voldemort so as long as they don't say the trace is the thing they've been using to detect all of your underage magic historically then it could just be that movie's version of they put a trace on Harry because they're corrupt as shit the still in the sentence lessens that, but yes, you can you can fans it away if you want. But the, well, the line let's, according let's, to let's, this, let's, I, no, you, I think you're right. I think that's that's terrible and awful and bad writing on every level. But let's see how it plays out when we watch the full movie. I, I, I I'm, yeah. I, I'm not so sure that's as definitive as maybe it seems initially. But I, I'm still fuck these movies oh, to death. Uh, they're the yeah. worst. They're really bad. Yeah. What um, was, what was your <laughs> except for this one's kind of okay, I guess. But that's uh, anyway. Um, so Grimold Place, um, they rem- they've taken the element. So the way uh, the Fidelius Charm is an interesting part of Harry Potter lore. It's how um, Harry's parents were betrayed. In the the Fidelius Charm is a way to hide a thing, and only the secret keeper can give away the secret. So the Potter's home was under the Fidelius Charm, and the secret keeper was Wormtail, and uh, that meant, assuming he never told anyone, Voldemort could literally walk up to the the front door of the house and not see it, or not be able to enter it, or see what's inside, or anything like that. And Wormtail's betrayal does that. So in the book, Grimald Place is hidden by the Fidelius charm, also. And Dumbledore is secret keeper, and anyone he tells can see it, which is what they do in the book, is they give Harry a piece of paper that's got a message from Dumbledore, and it says, I, Dumbledore you know, inform Harry of the secret headquarters of the Order of the Phoenix, 12 Grimoire Place, and then it appears to Harry, signed Dumbledore. In the movie, the very shortened version is they kind of make it like a, uh, 
like a like a diagonally thing. You know, Moody taps a few bricks and then it all moves. It's a really cool visual, actually. I like how it appears. It looks neat. Um, do, do you think establishing what a Fidelius charm is 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 more than this movie needs to bother doing at this point? I mean, do the Fidelius charms really play into other than going back and explaining what happened with Wormtail at some point? Do do we need the context for that here? Are you happy with it just being a simple yeah diagonally I'm sitch? Happy with- yeah, I'm happy with it just being a simple diagonally sitch. It's 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 magic in it. There's not a lot of. It's kind of actually one of the few examples of that background type magic I was talking about earlier. I know mm. it's not in the background, but that's sort of the magic of the world and not just people casting spells. And I think it's a cool visual. And I just think you don't you don't need it um, because you've already fucked it by not <laughs> by not going into it in Azkaban. So I uh, I think actually like it would have been exposition for the sake of exposition and actually going well we could do a cool visual here and just pass it off as magic in it. It's fine. Yeah, I, and I think I'll, that's you what, could that, make that's an argument for better. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's where I landed on it too. Um, wrote a little compliment here for the scene where Luna is the one that talks to Harry and makes him realise he's not treating his friends very well. Um, mm. And warning, they're sort of teaching him to be more considerate because in the book, I think it's Hermione that has that conversation with him where she says, look, Harry, we're on your bloody side. Can you stop snapping at us? We're the ones that believe you and are here for you. Stop. <laughs> Which is, comes from a slightly snippy place because he's just snapped at her unnecessarily. Um, I like peaceful, charming, you know. Uh, this version of Luna is so much more caring, I think, at least at first than the, than the book version. And I just love that sort of insight she has. It's very she's very, she's weirdly wise in this movie, and I love it. I just want to give that a comment, uh, little, you know. Little, little heads up, little thumbs up, I should say. Um, I really yeah. enjoyed Daniel Radcliffe's performance, particularly in the Hogsmeade, no, Hogshead scene. I thought that was great. Just, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, when he, when he, um, he's when he's he, great in this he does, movie. When he does all that stuff about, like, oh, look, it was, guys, like, I had almost always had help. A lot of it was luck. I, I, you've just got to understand this stuff serious, and I'm not, like, a master. Um, I thought it was really cool. That was really well played. Very, very humble, but, like, an honest, sincere, humble. I saw. I'm just going to say it here because the big D thing is relevant. It's probably more relevant for the uh, for when we talk about this movie. But there's a deleted scene that came up on my YouTube feed because I'm more I'm sort of more engaged with Harry Potter at the moment. And um, there's a deleted scene from Deathly Hallows where Dudley says goodbye to him, and oh. as and, and as as he walks away, Harry goes. See a big D, and Daniel Radcliffe's acting in it is such a small thing, but his acting in that moment is phenomenal. And oh, I think I'm um, so sad that's not in the movie. I was hoping that was still there. I love that moment in the book. Oh, yeah, that's no, a shame. It's, it's, it's it was it was certainly presented on YouTube as a cut scene. Um, oh. But yeah, it's so it's, Radcliffe is so good in that moment, and he's great in this film. I think he does. Um, I think he does angry very well. So yeah, it's good stuff. Um, I did just but write my notes. Also, at one point. also the the sweeter, yeah. heartwarming stuff as well. You know, at the end where he's we've got something to fight for and all of that stuff. He's great. Yes. He's great in this movie. Yeah, he is. And I, his conversations with Luna particularly bring that out in him every time. I think. Um, I wrote my notes. Nigel is back, baby. I love Nigel. Nigel. Give me some more Nigel, Love movie, Nigel. movies. Um, I, I made a note of a good joke. This movie's quite funny in places. It's not as funny as the last one. Or let me rephrase that, sorry. I think when this movie is funny, it's its hit rate is better. The jokes in this are pretty much all funny. Yes. Whereas the last mentioned... movie... Whereas the last movie threw shit at the screen every 10 seconds and hoped some of it would stick, and some of it did. But I want to particularly note the, uh, the manners moment when Ron gets defeated by Hermione and he's like, well, you know, I kind of let her. It's good manners in it. I just love that line so much. <laughs> it's great. One one I've got that we um, didn't re- haven't mentioned is uh, Arthur Weasley walking backwards through the gates at the tube. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. Very good. So, because, it, again, it's another one of those things of someone who understands how to adapt something. Because that's in the book, sort of, but it's him on the train not understanding how trains work, like by visually, but verbally, sorry. He's saying, wait, it's uh, how many stops, Harry, to this? And how does this money work, Harry? And it's all v- verbal sorry. stuff. To have him visually just not understand the, the thing and have Harry begrudgingly behind him making it work and him going backwards to it is a, is a beautiful moment. 
<laughs> There's just so much, man. Every I almost feel like every compliment can link back to that. You know, like I know I said it before, so I didn't say it again. But when you talked about Nigel, I was just like, man, that scene with Fred and George and Nigel and how it links to all of it, all yep. of the themes of the movie is so good. Again, competence is key, man. Yeah. <laughs> um. Two, two, oh, there's so much stuff to talk about this movie. Sorry, I'm, I know this is getting on now, but like, there's so much stuff. Um, no Lockhart. Do we want to talk about No Lockhart and No Neville's parents? Uh, we we lose Christmas on the crows on the closed ward, which is a which I think is a smart uh, deletion, but it does mean uh, Kenneth Branagh didn't get to do return to do Lockhart's little coda, which for those who don't know, uh, Lockhart is is in this book. Um, they find him on a closed ward at St Mungo's when they go to visit. Mr. Weasley, and he's clearly lost his bloody mind, and it's um, it's a really fun scene that then ends in tragedy when they see Neville visiting his his parents who have been on that ward. Um, I mean, it's, they're as good as dead. It's it's really heartbreaking to see they've you know tortured into madness, and 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 they don't really know who they are anymore or where they are. And um, Neville's mum hands him a sweet wrapper, and he says, "Thanks, mum." And his grand's like, "Throw it away," and he pockets it, and only Harry notices. It's a really great moment in the book, not in the film. I kind of know why, but when we get so much Neville stuff in this movie, it does feel like a shame to not have that. But I think, but I do I, also I, understand he, why for pacing. So I don't know. What what are your he, thoughts on that, Chris? Uh, it's kind of like I said earlier. I think the way they adapted Neville's story in general in this film, it, it feels right. And whilst that moment is a great one, well, one, even if you're doing that moment, for me, you're only doing it in a film for Frank and Alice. Um, you're not doing it for the Lockhart cameo. It's fun, but it's not needed. And right. you have to pay Kef- and you have to pay Kenneth Branagh. Um, let right. Neville. Let, yeah, don't at pay the Kenneth photo. Branagh and maybe use that money to improve your serious in the fire effect. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, got some footage um, of uh, Neville... got some footage of Gary Oldman. Just set the transparency to about fifty and drag it over some flames. <laughs> Lazy. <laughs> Someone did it. Like, did you in the trivia? You'll be like, did you know that a bit of this movie, Chris, was edited on Windows Movie Maker? Can you uh, <laughs> guess which scene? <laughs> it's, you um, know, what? I... it's really bad. I want to say this right now, very quickly. Sorry. Just if you're a special effects artist that worked on this movie, I'm very sorry. I'm not directly... It would have been time and money and it wouldn't have been your fault. And I'm sure whoever made that knew it looked shit and was sad that they didn't have more time or money to work on it. I understand that. I don't, I don't want to make it sound like I'm having a dig at the visual effects artist who I'm sure was capable of doing something very good but didn't get the chance. Sorry, I just needed to when... put that in. That's fine. When you, when you have a movie that is in part about... It feeling like it felt last time, which is a line Sirius says, and uh, Hagrid's got similar things as well, um, about this war beginning again and the notion (laughs) of the second Wizarding World War brewing. To have two orphans of the first war look at a photo of their mum and dad, have a conversation and decide to make them proud and fight and have that inform... Neville be going forward and Harry going forward, I think is a smarter version of that than than, than adapting the the hospital scene. So it's a shame because it's great, but I think what this movie does to adapt it is brilliant. Yeah, that's an interesting thought actually because yeah, because I mean the movie kind of I mean either implies or maybe outright clarifies Neville's parents in the movie universe dead right does he not say she killed my parents later on about bellatrix i don't have it in front of me but yeah i don't have it in front of me but possibly um wow yeah mm. anyway so yeah i think so, that's yeah, like, I yeah i think i i i, 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 think, yeah, yeah. On, I think on balance i agree with you i i'm i was i'm torn but i'm torn because i love that moment from the book so it's more of a mm. and it's always i mean i loved kenneth branner as lockhart so much there's just that selfish bit in my stomach that goes oh but I really like. I really. I, but you know what we talked about last week? The writers need to be bold and cut stuff to make this movie work. And you put too many. If you give in to too many of those, oh, but I really want that in the movie moments, then you're killing your budget and you're also killing the time. And then you're making the whole movie feel like the previous ones, which were, as we've established, yeah. Well, it's why you not know, good. Not <laughs> so, doing that. N- yeah. Not doing that is why this movie works. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, not doing that on mass to several moments like that. Yeah, agreed. Not that spe- <laughs> the the story doesn't just work because even, someone get rid of the Christmas at the close ward section. <laughs> the the but the Rita the, someone will feel that way about the Rita Skeeter scenes and the Rita Skeeter yes. scenes in Goblet of Fire are fun, but we still sat there last episode and went. 
they're not necessary so why would but, you have them in there correct. and i think we'd probably be having the conversation about christmas on the closed war yeah. if it happened in um, a slight criticism is from dialogue i just don't like harry's line where he says that voldemort was just better than cedric um uh, just take yeah, the line from the book. That. It's 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 the line in the book is shorter, and more nuanced, and uh, way better than that. It's it, I think it's Cedric knew all that stuff too. It's just when Voldemort really wants you dead, and then he trails off. Like it's <sighs> way better. It's also, and takes about it's as also, long to say. <laughs> it's also not true. I mean, like Cedric didn't even. And you know, I'm talking just films here, although it's films and books. Cedric didn't get a chance to fight him. Cedric right. doesn't doesn't right. have that moment. Right. Anyway. Yeah. 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 He was ambushed. He he was literally yeah. sucker punched with a death blow. Like, yeah, ridiculous. You know. Uh, so yeah, uh, bad line doesn't do anything for anyone. Um, thought that was really fun. Uh, not really fun. Really bad. We shouldn't have had that. Um, uh, we've talked about that. We've talked about that. Sorry. I'm now I'm now, with some a lot of this stuff in the later half of my notes we've actually covered. Oh, did you think it lessens the impact of Harry's hand scar to know all the kids probably have them because in the book only a two or three kids get that level of punishment from Umbridge. It's pretty significant that later on in the series when the when the ministry come to Harry for help he can show them a scar that says I must not tell lies and said after fucking umbridge you're coming to talk to me now after you put me through umbridge like does does giving all the kids a similar scar I think we can no, cuz I I think it's you know it's I can't remember I think it's I think they knew it would have been unlikely they were going to do that plot point from the books and I yeah. think the notion Again, with one Fair. of the themes of the film being the kids coming together, banding together, something to fight for, and that thing to fight for is each other. Having them all, and and as a motif for Fred and George's actions, as a, yes. sorry, as a plot point that propels that. I think in this film, it's right that they all have it and do it that way. Agreed. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're exactly right. Sorry, I've got so many of these notes, but I think a lot of this stuff is interesting and worth knowing. So yeah, um, yeah, I think you got. I think that's yeah. exactly right. Um, quick little quibble. Uh, they used the name Padfoot multiple times to refer to Sirius in this movie. Why? He was not established to be Padfoot in the previous movie that he was in. <laughs> they very deliberately cut that part out. It's weird and confusing. And I think if you're an audience member that's only watched these movies, you'd be like, who the fuck is Padfoot? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Yeah. Just so uh, they don't, they definitely don't have loop and go. I'll look it up now. They definitely don't have loop and go. I was he was Wormtail. I was Mooney. Nope. I don't believe so. Wow. Do not believe so. That's that not insanity. In any so, uh, yeah. That, no, that's not come up. That doesn't come up. They they they, re- they remove that altogether from these movies. Uh, Umbridge uh, putting down the picture of Fudge before, as she contemplates using the uh, using Crucio is one of my favorite little details. It's so it's it, the camera does follow her as she does That's it, great. but it's such a nice little character moment. Like the face down, the picture of Fudge. She has a picture of Fudge on her desk. That alone is enough. But yes, very good. Oh, I didn't mention this. Also, I love the book. It's like you know, uh, dark arts basics for beginners. Um, if anyone freeze frames it and looks at that book, it's genius. It's these two little caricatures reading the book and then on the cover of that book they're on it again looking at another version of it. it's just this weird never-ending hall of mirrors that i kind of love it's a, it's a dumb looking book and it's kind of a fun little design anyway um let's see uh i think we might be at the end of my notes oh uh, 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 um lucius's speech uh he's <sighs> Voldemort told Harry why or how he survived in the last movie. So why does Lucius be like, don't you want to find out how you survived? The, the, the thing Lucius should be saying is yeah. why Voldemort tried to kill you. That's the reveal, right? Is is the 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 the, 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 the this prophecy is the very reason Voldemort went after Harry in the first place. That's the thing we learn in this movie. Um, so why is Lucius talking about how Harry survived. It's just, we did that. We did that last movie. Movie. It's bad writing. Don't yeah, like that was it. weird. I, I thought that was bizarre as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've already talked about Harry and Dumbledore's conversation and the whole 
good stuff with Luna at the end, and there's something worth fun. Yeah, we covered it. That's, that's the last of my notes. Yeah, I don't have much to add on that thing, but I just think it's weird that this movie kind of forgets to put that part in, even though that's really integral. <laughs> so, yeah, strange. Anywho. Chris. Wait, what were you going back to the the uh, explaining how he died, uh, what had protected him thing then? Or something? You, you cut out a little bit, the, the phone cut out a little bit. Oh, I was mo- I was moving us on. I was saying like, yeah, I find that okay. I found that weird, and then I was like, well, yeah. let's 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 crack on. So, Chris, you know what time it is? Two two two, two hours forty minutes in. I think no, wait, three? No, we're not at three hours already, are we? No, yeah, two hours forty in. Two hours forty in, Dan. Everyone's ready for it. For the love of God, let's triv it up. Let's triv it up. I'm gonna give you some trivia because, quite frankly, we all want to get out of here. <laughs> I am sorry, everyone. I, I I didn't realize this episode would get so out of hand. But like, you know what? I I, I think it, there is a huge amount to discuss with this movie. I think this is a really interesting one. Um. So yeah, apologies to all. But yeah, and I think it's I think it's actually yeah. I think what's been nice is we've done we've done in the book in a good way. Do you know what I mean? The comparisons have been. It's been like, is this is this right to do it this way? Actually, no. The movie does it pretty well. It's nice to not be going. In the book, this has more context. It's nice to be going, in the book, it's this. But we can see why they've changed it. And they did a good job for, for that reason. So I think it's been a um, a different kind of in the book, which is, uh, yeah. Um, yes, but I think all, all interesting discussion. Uh, so. But let's, you know, let's make the let's make the trip concise. I'm joking. Let's, we're not going to do that. Everyone knows we're not going to do that. We haven't ranked let's, it yet. Let's... <laughs> Let's take it home. So, after Mike uh, Mike Newell declined as a direct uh, declined to return as a director following uh, Goblet, um, Mira because he couldn't be asked to read another big slab of a book. Was that it? Is that yeah, why? basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, Jean Pierre Jonet, uh, Guillermo del Toro, and Matthew Vaughan were all approached to direct this movie. Um, del Toro was busy with Hellboy two. And declined. Uh, Jeanette was a uh, preferred project with more creative control. Um, there's no reason given for why Matthew Vaughan didn't work out. That would have been great. I think Matthew Vaughan is fantastic. Uh, it, obviously, very early in Vaughan's career, wouldn't have been um, maybe not as polished as some of his latest stuff, you know, because people get better as they learn things. But I still think I would have much preferred Vaughan over Yates. Um, because Yates, to me, is like the least interesting Harry Potter director. He's the one that brings the least of his own sense of style to the movie, I think. Because everything that's interesting about this movie was would have been on the page. I Well, we, we don't know about things like The Prophet and, and those transitions and stuff. But although there is a new editor for the first time, I think Mark... Mark Day came on board on this film as well. Um, I will say, though, as much as I agree with you about Yates and he's not my favourite director by far of the series, I do like that from the point when Voldemort returns, we have a consistent director. I think the films need a consistent tone from this point onwards. So I am glad that we at least got the same director for the remaining four movies. Even if that director is David Yates. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. I'd have preferred Alf- Alf- Alfonso Caron for all four, but, you know, in a, in a world of this versus a different director each time, well, then again, if it was a better one. Anyway, yeah, point stands. I, I like that we got a consistent thing. Sure, at least. okay, yeah, I'll take that, I'll take that. Yeah, I just think Yates is like, he's just like a non... He's like a... He's like a... He's the bassist of directors. Like, you know, he's doing his job. The, 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 it's, he, the bass line is in the song but you really don't notice it's there. Like, it's just sort of, like, playing along with the rhythm guitar. Like, he just sort of exists. I, I find his movies very characterless. I don't know why. Um, I, I don't know. They, they, don't, they, don't have, they don't have anything distinct or charming about them. They're just kind of very direct visual translations of what appears to be on the page to me. That's how I interpret it. But anyway. Um, Yates uh, believes he was approached because the studio saw him fit to handle... Um, an emotional movie with a political backstory uh, because some of his previous television projects, including State of Play, Sex Traffic and The Girl in the Cafe, had demonstrated a a skill at both of those things. Uh, Producer David Heyman supported Yates' comments about the movie's political theme, saying The Order of the Phoenix was a political film, not with a capital P, but it's about teen rebellion and abuse of power. Uh, Yates has made films in the UK about politics without being heavy-handed. 
Um, Emma Watson has also spoken on the movie's political stuff and said somehow it talks about life after July 7, the way people behave when they're scared, where the way truth is often denied and the things our society has to face. Facing the fact that authority is corrupted means having a non-conformist approach to reality and power. I thought that was very, very well said. Smart mm, girl. I'd agree. Um... Uh, God, that sounded really patronizing. Smart girl. I just meant to say, like, that was she's 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 smarter than I am. Like, that's a that's a clever thing to say. Um, the only Harry Potter screenplay not written by Cloves. We've already talked about that. Who was unable to do this one because of other commitments? Uh, Michael Goldenberg, who was considered to pen the first movie, was then who they approached um, because he was already. I guess they'd already sort of had those conversations with him, knew what he was after, and you know trusted him to, to do it. He just couldn't do the first one for whatever reason. Um, I would have liked to have seen more of. I, I look. I know this guy wrote like like Green Lantern or whatever, but like yeah, I think I, I would have. I think I would have preferred a world where he did more of these movies. But oh well. Oh god, um, yeah, jeez, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so is it Sasha Ronan? I, I never can pronounce her name right. So Sasha Ronan and Juno Temple were both considered for the role of Luna Lovegood. That is bonkers. I don't think either of those are right for the role. And I like uh, Sasha Ronan. I think she's great. Would she have been a good Luna, though? I think she might have been though. I do because, but I have a real soft spot for her. I think she's, I think she's a brilliant actress. So. Yeah, she is. No, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I agree with you. I think she, she's been, she's brilliant. I mean, a little woman's amazing. She's great in it. But like, I don't know, Luna. Yeah, I think, too, I think, I think it's just not seen it, two together to be Luna. <laughs> maybe, but it's just, it's so, it's so hard when Ivana, Iv- Ivana Lynch is is one of the most iconic performances, isn't it, in, yeah. in the series? So, agreed. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and Juno Temple would have been good too, obviously. You know, Juno, I mean, Juno, went, Juno Temple went on to, to work with, with, with Danny Radcliffe anyway. She did, she thinks she was in Horns, right? So, uh, yeah, but yeah, the, 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 you know, she's, she's, she's doing all right, you know, Ted Lasso and all. So, good stuff. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, yeah, and I don't think she would have been particularly right for that role either, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, in late 2005, Anna Friel, who at the time was dating David Thuellis, uh, lobbied for the role of Tonks, knowing, I presume, mm. that those two characters end up together. Um, I think she would have. I think she, you know, she she wanted to do that. Producers turned it down. I'm not really sure why. Um, I, I you know, I think the actress we got is very good. Anna Friel would have been good. Mm. Anna Friel's a very talented actress. So, mm. well. and, and could I join think... the list of my rant last week about these amazing actors doing. Bugger, saying bugger all lines. <laughs> yeah, but here's the thing: I think like with the actress they got for Tonks, the only the only downside to the actress they did get for Tonks is she is she's she, she's on the young side, and Anna Friel wasn't exactly like. I just think like Anna Friel was closer to David Duellers' age than Tonks. Uh, the, the the actress they actually got to play Tonks, and I just think like they should have maybe kept that in mind because I always found the Tonks looping relationship leaning towards Icky, depending on how it's depicted. You know, in terms of the age difference. Uh, depends how it's played. So, ah, uh, you know, give me, give me Anna Friel because she, I think she was older than the actress they chose. But hey, maybe that's just me. Um, no, I think I think that's a fair thing. I'm just looking up the uh, what's is, is David Thiel. Oh, there we go, David. David Thiel. I yeah, still so think David Thiel Thiel... is older than Anna Friel. Or maybe not. Maybe not. No, I don't. I think certainly closer in age, which is which is yes. your point. Uh, yes. Uh, so, Anna, I can't spell for real. So I've got Anna Friel as being forty six at present. Yeah. So David Thrill is fifty nine at present, and Natalia Tenner is thirty seven at present. Right. So there's a twenty odd year age gap between the actress that plays Togs and the actor that plays mm. Lupin. There would have only been a ten year age gap between if it had been mm. for Anna Friel. I don't know. Uh, but all it, it is interesting in general in these in these films they've sort of aged up the Marauders quite a bit because I I looked it up because I was sort of doing some fan casting in my head on if you were making it now and uh, apparently the Potters died at twenty one which means Snape Lupin Sirius are all thirty thirty two. Mm-hmm. Ish in the books, um, so yeah. they're all sort of aged up in the in the films. No bad yeah. thing because the performances are incredible, but interesting. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting. Um, Daniel Radcliffe apparently came up with the idea that 
as a gesture of respect to his former teacher, um, who Harry looked up to, when he was teaching in the DA, he would wear clothing that resembled the outfits worn by Lupin in his lessons from Prisoner of Azkaban. Mm. Nice. It's a really nice idea, and David Yates apparently enjoyed that suggestion, and then, you know, be- that became the basis for his look during those scenes. So there you go. Um, mm. J.K. Rowling provided more than 70 names for the Black Family Tree Tapestry. That is very J.K. Rowling. And for those listening who don't know, well, obviously we've already established this in the earlier ones, but if you've jumped in on this one, J.K. Rowling, boo, we understand. But obviously to review these movies and talk about Harry Potter without referencing her would be weird and strange. Um, yeah, so you know, we, we agree with that but are talking about these 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 things that she made. Uh, so yeah, she she the Black Family Tree Tapestry, 70 names. The detail, again, is mad. Uh, apparently several members of the Black Family are named after astro- uh, astronomical objects, so you can see many of those names in the scene where Sirius and Harry are in the family tree room. Obviously Sirius, Regulus, Andromeda, uh, Arcturus, Bellatrix, and Cygnus. Ke- Ke- oh, I don't know how to pronounce that one. Are ones that can be seen. Um... Where are we? At around 48 minutes into the movie, when we discover the room of requirement, Ron asks if it could become a bathroom if it's you, if the user really needed it. This is a little sneaky reference to the book when um, Professor Dumbledore describes having an exceptionally full bladder and a room magically appearing, and that's how we have the room of requirement introduced in the books. Uh, and then when it actually becomes a part of the story, Harry goes, oh, Dumbledore kind of partially mentioned this. Um, so having Ron ask about the bathrooms is a little nod to that. Um, and actually, I think also slightly a nod to, oh, no, it wouldn't have been because the final book wasn't out yet. There's a line in the final book when Seamus says, you know, oh, it gave us everything we wanted, beds and all that stuff, and even a pretty good bathroom once girls joined us. Um, well, I thought it was a really fun line. Um, but yeah, it wouldn't have been a reference to that because that wasn't out yet. So, um, Helen McCrory was originally cast as Bellatrix Lestrange, but due to her pregnancy, was unable to perform uh, the role. Uh, she was replaced by Helena Bonham Carter, um, and McCrory was later invited back to be cast as Narcissa Malfoy, who is, of course, Bellatrix's sister. So she comes back in the next movie with a role, which is nice. I'm glad she didn't lose out uh, because of that. Yeah, definitely. Brilliant, brilliant actress. Mm-hmm. Very good. Yeah, Ivana Lynch beat 15,000 other girls for the role of Luna Lovegood. No wonder we had a couple of other famous names in there when we listed it earlier. Um, she was apparently ninth in a line of 30 finalists. Um, and when it came to viewing audition videos, David uh, Barron stopped viewing other audition videos after hers and just said, she is Luna. Um, you, she was actually... the JK angle of that in the truth? So she she wrote to J.K. Rowling, right? I don't I don't know. I, I tried looking into this. What was the you know was there an outcome to that? Did that have any impact on this, or is it just a coincidence? She also happened to be a big fan who'd written to J.K. Yeah, no massive coincidence. So there's an interview. Steve Cloves and J.K. Rowling sit and interview each other. It's about forty seven minutes, I think. It's on YouTube, and within that, J.K. Rowling talks about how the only actor that really then influenced her writing of the character moving forward was Ivana Lynch as Luna Lovegood because she is so Luna. And Ivana Lynch and J.K. Rowling started up a uh, pen pal relationship before she got cast. And then Luna Lovegood gets cast and the casting director turns to her and says, oh, we found Luna Lovegood. She's uh, an actress called Ivana Lynch. And J.K. Rowling was like, that's the girl I've been writing to about about Luna Lovegood. Like, So she had no influence on it, um, wow. but was completely stunned to discover that the girl she'd been writing to thinking, you're very Luna, then got cast as Luna. Yeah, see, that's the thing. So, now, I knew that she'd written to J.K., but I couldn't find out if that actually played... Because it didn't sound like that played an effect on it, because we've got a description of the director being like, that's Luna, completely separate yeah. so that is the yeah, story no, it was. that it was separate very good yeah. appreciate that um, she's great obviously we talked about her but uh, yeah so James Phelps who plays Fred and Oliver Phelps who plays George make cameo appearances besides their roles of Fred and George in this in the picture of the original Order of the Phoenix they're playing the yeah. deceased uncles Fabian and Gideon Pruitt oh wow really nice so that's yeah, a good detail that's cool nice touch I like that um, so apparently Emma Watson was seriously considering uh, not continuing after this instalment, but decided to stay on after considering that it would be uncomfortable to watch the movies 
being made with someone else as Hermione. She become obviously a bit attached to the role. So there you go. I think at this point, I'll be honest with you, I don't know exactly how old she would have been at this point, but she can't have been far off or having just passed 18. And I do recall very gross websites existing at the time about her turning 18, like countdowns and stuff. Very upsetting. And um, yeah, I've got horrific. to imagine it won't... It's not a coincidence she decided or thought about quitting acting around this stage. And I'm not saying that's... I, you know, Obviously, we don't know what her reasoning was, but that can't have fucking helped. So... No, uh, no, no. And I, uh, I'm i really glad she decided to stay. And the, the, all of them did. did, really. I think a a switch in actors, especially for, you know, the children's film series would have been, uh, you know, hard for the audience. Um, obviously, if she felt she needed to, that would have been absolutely fine and, and the right choice for her personally. Um, but I'm glad it, I'm glad it didn't work out that way as a as a fan. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, Dumbledore's line, don't fight him, Harry. Harry uh, don't fight him, Harry, you can't win, was featured prominently in about every single trailer and television spot for this movie, yet it is nowhere to be seen in the final version of this movie or its deleted scenes. <laughs> weird. <laughs> yeah, I don't even weird. know where that would have been. Where would Dumbledore have told yeah. Harry not to fight him? Uh, at the end, I assume, but then that conflicts slightly with it's not how you're different, it's the same. It's, yep. how, it's not yep. how you're the same, it's how you're different, so... Weird. I have no idea. Yeah. There you go. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's just funny. Um, Imelda Staunton was the producer's only choice for the role of Dolores Umbridge. She and costume designer Jani Termain, or Termain, uh, came up with the idea of making the dress more padded and saturated as the movie progressed. Um, the novel obviously describes the character as being physically chubby like a toad. Um, I would disagree with the frog-like face, toad-like face, but I don't know if the book necessarily describes the character as chubby, but sure. Um, Stephen King has said that the character of Dolores Umbridge is the greatest uh, make-believe villain to come along since Hannibal Lecter. He's right. <laughs> I think he's referring to the book Praise indeed. Though. Yeah. But yeah, it's great. Uh, the radish yeah, like earrings. Say, she's 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 Go given. On, she's more villainous in the book. Like we said earlier, she's more villainous in the book. Yes, I would agree. I would agree. Uh, the radish earrings worn by Luna Lovegood were made by Ivana Lynch herself. Mm, For nice. accuracy, I guess. Uh, Tonks's hair was made purple instead of pink um, because the filmmakers felt the color was too much associated with Umbridge. Uh, I think that's fair. Fine, makes sense. Fair, good choice. Uh, Kenneth Branagh was set to return as Gilderoy Lockhart in a brief cameo. Uh, he was going to obviously appear um, when they were visiting Ron's dad at the hospital at St. Mungo's. The scene was meant to establish Lockhart as having irreco- irreconceivable... Irre- 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 oh God, irreversible amnesia? I don't know. That's not the word they've used here, but I'm going to use irreversible amnesia from his backfired curse in the previous movie, as well as covering the insanity of Neville's parents after being tortured by Bellatrix of Strange. The scene was cut for pacing and budget issues as it would have necessitated building a new set. So this is another one of those happy accidents then, I guess, because I, I think I've landed on that. I agree with you. Um, but it is interesting to think it would have been, it was it that was one of the things that was genuinely in the script. So there you go. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, I think it the turned pro- out for the best. Go- yeah, it, it turned that. out for the best, I think. Yeah. Um, during the breakfast scene in the Great Hall, the box of cereal can be seen. I like this one. The names of the cereal are Cheery Owls and Pixie Puffs. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, the colour schemes of these boxes are similar to those of Cheerios and Sugar Puffs. <laughs> Fantastic stuff. At the time, the most expensive set they'd done on one of these movies was the 200-foot long hallway for the Ministry of Magic. I've seen parts of that set up close and in person. It is spectacular. Those shiny green tiles are amazing. Apparently, they're made out of cardboard and just painted Looks, heavily. It, it, it looks brilliant. The scene, the scene at the end where it all explodes and uh, the big picture of Fudge gets destroyed, and like the symbolism of that and the politics, it's all brilliant. Yes, very good, excellent. Um, although this is the longest book in the seven book series, it's the shortest movie in the franchise. Uh, the longest movie, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, is based on the second shortest book. We've kind of already said that, but it was relevant to this movie too. So there it is. Um, let's mm-hmm. see all the interior Hogwarts scenes were filmed on studio sets making this the first Harry Potter movie not to utilise any of Britain's castles and cathedrals for filming um, 
cover this for a second, actually. I think this is probably worth a, a little discussion. Uh, when Dumbledore's army meet in the Hogshead Inn, there's a bartender accompanied by a goat, played by Jim McManus. Uh, this is credited as barman, but the character is later ad- ad- identified in the movies as Aberforth Dumbledore. The professor's younger brother, the character re- returns, Deathly Hallows Part 2, but played by a different actress, Kieran Hines. How, do we, uh, how are we feeling about that? What about the recasting? Well, yeah, the choice to have him in it here, but like not use him or like or like not cast him so you could bring him back later and then well, if, recast him. And yeah, there's a few. Well, it's yes, it's we, a strange choice. It, yeah, if the final book wasn't out at this point, then I don't know why you would retcon it if you're going to recast it anyway. So just keep it as a different barman in this, and then make it Aberforth in the in the when right. you do the last. Do movie. We, yeah, because we don't even need to. See, do we need to see the barman? No, so it's just a bar. I think just stick with because it, it's the retconning of it, isn't it? Like they retconned it to be him later. No, no, the, so... the, no, no, the, the, the goat is it's 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 it, Aberforth loves goats. It's supposed to be Aberforth, right? Okay, okay, fine. Um, yeah, I guess you don't need to see the barman then. Just do that. Yeah, <laughs> it's weird. It's a weird choice if you don't. But know how did they know? But has, if the final book wasn't out, did J.K. tell them to call it that? Then she must have done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Weird. That seems another weird one to sort of go, oh, tell you what, like again, mention mention the mirror, JK. <laughs> yeah, again, because cause again, I'm sort of like, there's no question that it's Aberforth because the, the you know, that, that goat thing is undeniable. You know, the, the Ariana goat connection and even Dumbledore's passing line about, you know, the, the Aberforth had once been in trouble for performing spells on goats, which was, I always found weird as a sentence in the books but you know the, 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 it's, yeah it's but that's not that's to... not in the film but that's not in this film is it but yeah yeah no but yeah but that, that link is is clearly that's who it's meant to be so yeah very strange yeah um this that's is a fun weird. one uh dolores umbridge puts 25 educational decrees in place in the book in the movie she puts over 100 <laughs> <laughs> that's good i like that um, filming was put on hold for two months during May so that Daniel Radcliffe could take his AS levels and Emma Watson could take her GCSEs nice hmm. um, that, I think that's interesting because obviously lead characters you, they want to go do exams you've got to stop shooting it's probably different for the other kids yeah. who could probably just be worked around um, Alistair mad Moody uh, has a prosthetic leg this is a great detail so he could not balance properly on a broomstick um, you know, and therefore was unable to use sort of the normal stirrups. Instead, his broom has like this weird contraption where his leg sort of rests uh, and a seat that allows him to lean backwards and a control stick for his hands. It's all very good. It looks weird, kind of like a car, but it's not. It's a broom. It, and when you first see it, you go, why the hell is his broom so weird? And then you think, oh yeah, the leg. It's very clever. It's a nice detail. I wouldn't have thought about it. <laughs> if if yeah, he'd have just okay. climbed on a broom That's as normal, good. I'd have been like, yep, cool. <laughs> I wouldn't have questioned that. So, <laughs> no. good effort movie. <laughs> Um, the room of requirement is described in the book as a room with no beginning or end to achieve the sense of infinite, infinity the visual effects crew spent about five months designing the room to have rotatable mirrors installed that would minimise uh, camera and crew reflection as well as avoid this sort of hall of, mi- hall of mirrors effect um, a common term in CGI also lighting underneath the grill was quite uh, was quite bright to generate reflection, so the floor had to be kind of black. The cast members had to have black velvet covering all of their bottoms of their shoes, and the crew had to wear surgical shoes to prevent treading dust on the floor set. So it sounds like that set was a bit of a nightmare to both work in and around, but it looks great. Mm. It does look good. Yeah, it looks fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I will say production design seems to be right now. Like I, you know, I had some concerns about when Curon came on, how much change they did to the visuals of the the, the, the stuff. They seem to have kept Curon's layout. I've noticed they cross that bridge and down the hill is Hagrid's hut. They really there's mm. an establishing shot in this movie that's that exactly, and it's from Azkaban. I was like, okay, so the movies it's just the first two where the layout is different. They keep it pretty consistent after that. So well, we'll see. We we we've still got a couple more to go, but so far so, so consistent since three. Um, uh, the only ne- uh, spell that Neville c- uh, uses successfully, Petrificus Totalis, in this movie, is the same spell that Hermione used on him in the first one. So there you go. Fun mm, little nice. detail. Uh, mm. The code to enter the Ministry of Magic from the street is 62442. This spells out the word magic on a phone. Nice. Very nice. 
Love it. Uh, the movie. Was, ah, yeah, here we go. The movie was released ten days before the final book. So ten days. It was. It seems like it would have been written while production was happening or being written. So she would have had a lot of the details. Um, because uh, Davis Warwick Davis has so little screen time uh, in his usual Flitwick role in this movie, he was allowed to do an uncredited cameo as an unarmed, an unarmed, an unnamed ministry uh, personnel. Uh, he gets in the elevator with Harry as they're heading up. I noticed him straight away because he's Warwick Davis. Mm. And he's, he's got a very distinct face, um, but mm. I thought it was very nice they got him into the movie in more ways. I like Warwick Davis. Put him in everything. Make him put him in all the scenes. I'm happy for that. No yeah, problem. Agreed. Um, according to the original script, the character of Creature was not intended to be in the movie at all. But, oh, we talked about this. But after J.K. Rowling read the script, she more or less insisted on him being there to avoid some serious problems with future installments. Though Creature has no noticeable impact on the plot or, um, or story of this movie as it's presented, um, a couple of scenes with him were added at the last minute based on this request. So there you go. Um, final ones. Uh, when Harry, Ron and Hermione are discussing Harry's kiss with Cho. The three begin to crack up near the end of the scene. This is actually genuine laughter. The three actors just started laughing at the whole thing, and Yates thought it was a really nice scene and kept the camera rolling and put it in the movie. So there you go. Mm, it's a nice um, moment. A couple of... Two like, tiny, tiny, tiny more ones. You know, the usual... Uh, cars exist, Chris. Cars exist. Meow. Thank you. So in this movie, there are a couple of cars viewed. None of them play a prominent role, but I'll quickly tell you what they are because you know what? We've committed to this and I'm doing it. So the Dursley's car seems to be a Vauxhall Vectra Mark II. Um, There's a Seddon Atkinson Pacer seen in the background. There's also a Nissan Primera and a D8. uh, What? uh, Oh, a truck at one point is seen. That's a DAF XF95. Um, Cool. <laughs> and the very final thing, Chris, dogs exist. Woof. <laughs> ruff, ruff, ruff. Uh, we've been doing this for too long. Um at around twenty five minutes, um Sirius Black shows up in his uh canine form, his animagus form. Um not looking like a CGI dog now, but a real one. He the dog in question was played uh by a Scottish deerhound named Cloud. I don't think you slipped in your wand one, did you? Oh, fuck, I pulled it up as well and everything. Oh, I'm so sad. I, 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 I pulled... Oh. During the Harry Potter movies, Daniel Radcliffe went through 160 pairs of glasses. I'm so annoyed. I had it there in the document and I just... I must have skipped past it or something. Oh, that's so annoying. Yeah, that's all right. Don't worry. See, that's how, that's how much I'm listening. Yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah. We've now proven the opposite, the big... Chris, that you're very much listening. Um, yeah, so, dear Lord, sorry that was so long, everyone. Hopefully people enjoyed it. We're nearly at three hours. We, oh, no, we're just crossing three hours now. So, um, yeah. Um, well, the ranking, big question, Chris. Dan, where are, you, where are you ranking it? Yeah, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with this one. Uh, put, tell me where you're putting it. I, I want to have, have another thing. I'm, I'm, I'm torn. I'm torn about I'm, where this goes. I'm putting it. I'm putting it top. I really am putting it straight to the top. It look, don't get me wrong, that benefits from watching it so close to Goblet of Fire, which I put at the bottom. But I think the what would put it above so I think arguably maybe there's no there's even plot holes in chamber. Look, it is my previous top was prisoner and I I did admit incredibly close into gap wise to Chamber of Secrets. The big thing for Chamber of Secrets is how kind of uh uh, how concise it not concise how how much it doesn't feel like there's the plot holes it doesn't suffer from the uh you're missing the context of the book the big thing for prisoner is how altered it is and the the cinematography and the look and feel of it but i just every other film in the series so far i have watched going this feels like it's missing context it's missing scenes it's missing it feels like it's paced weirdly it feels like someone wouldn't understand this whilst they are just competent things for most films i think it is the strongest adaptation i think it is the strongest script i think things like the daily profit stuff the dream stuff and the montages are all really great filmmaking choices i think the acting is better i think as a story i just prefer the story the way the story unfolds and is told i think there are whilst some of the positives are like well you know it's 
you are you giving it points for that? Yeah, compared to some of the other films in this series, I am. And all of those things for me are, you know, I there's no in spite of. So I love Prisoner of Azkaban for the altered nature and the visual, uh, how it looks visually, in spite of the fact that the plot falls apart a bit and the fact that they don't go into detail about the Marauder stuff. I love Chamber of Secrets because it feels very complete, in spite of the fact that there are still some weird choices, some of the acting is a bit dodgy. There's not really, other than the, the nitpicks and the things we have discussed, I don't have many in spite of with this film. Uh, and I have an awful lot of positives, and I think it is the most standalone of them so far. Um, in terms of you could watch this with no context and still get it. And also, it for you know as many points as Prisoner of Azkaban gets for the alteredness in the cinematography, this is a film that actually studies Harry Potter and actually takes Harry Potter on a journey. And the character work that they do the payoffs, the way they link it all in that last you know, bit where Voldemort's trying to overthrow him and you go, oh, this scene here is exploring all the themes of the movie and of the character. The fact that things are not just put, done for the scene and for the purpose of the scene they're in, all of those things, it gets, it gets the points for me and I'm putting this, I'm rocketing this film straight to the top of my ranking. Um, what, what about you, Daniel? You are currently to remind people to give you a last moment to think. Dan is currently from bottom to top, Goblet, Stone, Azkaban, Chamber of Secrets. Where you where you put in order of the Phoenix, Dan? Yeah, so I mean that's well, yeah, it's worth clarifying, isn't it? Because I think you, you're similar, right? You've got you've got Goblet right at the bottom. Oh yeah, as do I. See, I've got you, Goblet. Yeah, gob, Goblet, Stone, Chamber, Azkaban, Order. Right, but before you added order, it was Azkaban was your top one. So for you, it was a question of, does this pip Azkaban or not? So for me, this becomes yes. a question of, does this pip Chamber or not, right? Because it's very high. It's one of the top couple, for sure. I, I, I don't... So for me, it, it, you know, uh, I, I think it easily pips Azkaban because I think Azkaban has a lot more of the issues that become prevalent in like Goblet, you know, than than than, than this one. Uh, the, by, but it's, it's not even. I don't even think it's close. Actually, I think this soars over those bottom three. The question for me is: Is it superior to Chamber? Now, Chamber has a massive advantage. It's a way shorter book, and probably one of the only Harry Potter books that has a really clear, concise through line story that lasts the whole year and is a mystery that then unfolds. Plus the joy of Kenneth Branagh's Lockhart, plus that sort of magic that Christopher Columbus brought to those first few movies. So I'm really struggling on whether it goes above Chamber or not. Right now, I think I'm going to say not. Because the stuff with Dumbledore at the end, the missing scenes there, are too essential. Mm. The, the, the mm. fumble to, 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 to get so close... And just not dunk it at the end when you got there with actually exploring. Because we can compliment this movie for its character work all we want. But to not explore the ramifications of Harry almost, or not almost, sorry, getting his uncle killed. Not uncle? Mm. Step, what, what, not your step what the fuck? My brain has died. Godfather. His Godfather, Godfather. Thank you. Godfather. Uh, his Godfather killed. The, you know, the, 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 pa- the only parental figure he has left. To not do that. And then to not bother explaining the prophecies or give context to why Voldemort even wanted it in the first place. That's the sort of shit that we didn't like in the other movies. And while it is way less prevalent in this one and puts it above most of those other movies, there's pretty much, there's less of that in two. Plus the magic of Columbus and Kenneth Branagh's version of Lockhart, which is still to this day one of the best performances this franchise has. So... I think right now two remains my top, with this one just under it. Um, and I think well, if they changed that scene, I would have felt differently. There you go. There we go. Those are those are the rankings. Let's uh, let's tune in. Tune in next week to find out where Half Blood Pr- Prince falls in all of that. And uh, low yeah, do you wanna, do you will be do my the, guess. Where can the pr- <laughs> um, my, my guess, Chris, will be low. <laughs> um, yeah. Very quickly. I, I'll be honest. I, yeah, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to extend this any more than possible, but there is a huge question I wanted to ask you that we didn't get to. Can I quickly do it now? 
Yeah, sure. How do you feel about the spell hitting Sirius being a Varda Kedavra? Because in the... In, he, he little push his glass up nose. In the book, um, he's stunned and falls through the veil, and it's unclear. Well, no, he's hit by a spell, with a rebounding spell or something, and we don't, I don't think it's clear that it's a Varda Kedavra. In this book, it's like, we know he's dead, and then he goes through the veil. Yeah, I think in the in the book you can go into more about the veil and it's it's kind of while it's still a bit of a mystery it's sort of made clear it's essentially a a representation of the of the of the sort of boundaries or doorway or whatever between the 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 world of the living and the world of the dead so and it's a bit more you know harry can specifically ask the question um i think making i think you that doesn't fit into the themes into everything else in the in the film, that would have slowed the pacing down. I think, as you said, if they're going to devote time to anything in those last few scenes, it should be the exploring the the Harry, the weight of of it being, um, you know, Harry's actions that have led to it or Dumbledore's. So I think, with all that in mind, adding that clarity to it, um, I think is, you know, using that spell adds that clarity to it. So I think I think it's fine. I understand. Yeah, I just, it. I just, I pulled up the, I pulled up the scene in the book just to think, and it's, yeah, it's, it's unclear. Just a second jet of light hit him squarely on the chest. The laughter had not quite died on his face, but his eyes widened in shock. So it's not clear uh, what the spell was that hit him. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I think just taking out that doubt is just one less plot thing mm. because the next thing that happens in the book is a whole thing where Harry's determined that he's still alive and uh, you know ready any second to jump back out of the veil and continue the fight like Harry goes into denial and while that is very powerful in the book um, I think it would muddle this so I, I, I think I, well, even though I was like sh- sh- surprised by that change I think it makes sense when you think about it if, if anything apart from the issue of dealing with Harry maybe hover wanting to hover over a body for too long if anything i'd have been tempted to get rid of the veil stuff in some ways because i think you do leave the film going what's that veil thing about like and if you've right. not read the books that could be confusing um so yeah and no one weird in the not, film weird asks add, it not weird not to add luna's line about the veil as well yeah i did something so if anything i would have maybe even to make it really clean, you maybe even get rid of that, or or add Luna's line, or or Dumbledore talks about it, or something. I don't know, but yeah, mm. yeah, because I think Luna has a, a great really scene, a great book, scene but... that you just, of, of course, you don't have time for, but a great scene in the book is also where he goes and speaks to Nearly Headless Nick, um, and Nearly Headless yes. Nick is like Sirius wouldn't have moved, wouldn't have stayed behind. Um, beautiful writing, yes. but anyway, yeah, yes. Where can the uh, where can peeps find us, Dan? So you can get us on Patreon if you'd like to support us financially and also hear episodes a week early. So if you want to hear us talk about uh, the Half-Blood Prince, you can go do that now. Head over to the Patreon for as little as $1 a month or more if you're feeling extra generous. You get on the Patreon, you can hear episodes a week early. I'll put this and rewind... No, this is Rewind Reviews and Analyzing Avatar, which will be coming back in the new year with a series based on Korra because we've covered Avatar already. That's available on Spotify. Speaking of, you want to help us out in a way that's not financial, you can support us on Spotify and iTunes and all those places by giving us likes and reviews and stars and hearts and all that jazz the other way you can support us of course is by going over to the youtube channel and giving us likes and subscribes and things like that on there or of course if you have something to say you did you disagree with something we said in this podcast we got something wrong in this podcast very likely we haven't really covered that we usually are very good at going like look guys we're not experts on any of this shit if we get it wrong let us know. Um, we haven't really done that so far. We've come into this with that. We're Harry Potter experts. This is our shit. Yeah. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, you know, uh, but I think we, if anything, Chris, we, uh, taking on a 780 page Harry Potter book um, movie adaptation and deciding to make the podcast an hour longer than the film it's adapting is probably the most, you know, the, the most apt thing we could have done in this moment. <laughs> True. That's fair. <laughs> Um, yeah so uh, yeah if you want to send us comments or thoughts because we got something wrong or we've mischaracterized something or you just I don't know you've got, you've got your own thoughts on this adaptation um, feel free to send them over you can do it a few different ways you can get us on Twitter I'm at Dan Doolan Chris is at C Billingham with two M's of course you can get us in uh, on like you know the, the, the usual like places like YouTube channel if you want to put a comment on the video of this then you can do that and then the final way you can do it of course is by uh, by email uh, mail at nothingbutstatic.co.uk will 
will reach us. Uh, we don't always reply, but we do like to read them. So um, please do feel free to share your thoughts. We really enjoy hearing from you. We do have a Discord as well, but the Discord is only accessible through the Patreon. Um, so yeah, join on the Patreon, then you can get a link to the Discord and come chat with us in, in, in real time um, there. It's been very quiet in the Patreon for uh, the Discord for a little while, but you know, it's, it it picks it, it ebbs and flows. Sometimes it's quite busy when yeah. there's something going on. Sometimes it's quiet. Uh, but yeah, that's I think all of the places that they can get us. Yeah, sure. I think so. Because even if it isn't at this point, who's listening? <laughs> <laughs> and with that in mind, then in that case, I'm Chris Billigan. I'm Dan Doolin. <laughs> and this review in the Wizarding World has been rewound. And now, Dan, uh, if you want to say that the Wizarding World term is shit, yeah, it is shit. I why like it's ju- wizards are a thing, Chris. It's not specific uh, enough, uh, Dan. It's not Dan, specific Dan, enough, Dan. Dan, you got yes. like you've got like what? Hold on, you, this is five. We're doing eleven. You got six more movies to make this point. At this point, with three with three hours twenty in, just say it's shit. Save the rant for next time. <laughs> oh, it's fucking really shit. <laughs> there we go. But the Star Wars movies, the fucking space world, shall we? Lord of the Rings world. Oh, it's the, 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 from the fantasy world. Fucking shit. I mean, they do get referred to as the Middle Earth, what, the, the stories of Middle Earth or something, don't they? Yeah, but that's that's specific. Middle Earth is a Tolkien term. The wizard wizarding world is just a. There are wizards. Wizards are wizards are not exclusive to the world of Harry Potter. They are a concept long before that. It's too vague. That's fair. I hate it. I hate it. That's fair. I hate everything about it. I hate how fucking cooked up in a fucking boardroom it is. Ugh, it just stinks of some fucking guy coming in in a suit and being like, hey guys, you know what the kids are like? If we give this branding some sort of title, then they can just recognise the words and the logo and they'll know what it's about. They'll know it's from the wizarding world of Harry Potter. Let's stick that logo on all the things. Will it suit them? Will it look good on any of it? No. Bunch of dicks. I hate being hungry because we've been podcasting for three hours and 40 minutes. Uh, I ate before we started recording. <laughs> huh? You what, sorry? I ate before we started, so who's winning now? You hate the film we started? You what? Oh, you ate no, before I, we started, I, right. Well, yeah, I ate before we started. <laughs> Wizard- well, I'm glad you had time to do that, Dan. Wizarding World sucks. I'm off. See you later. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>